So, um, so welcome everybody. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, a neural net uh, uh, speech enhancement today, as you probably know. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an outline of what we're gonna do, um, here's the next uh, three hours of your life. Um, so we're gonna talk. We're gonna start by uh, talking a little bit about uh, some background, how we do some denoising, how we can get started with uh, with all those things. Uh, we'll move on to talking about how we get from sort of traditional DSP methods to neural nets and how there's a sort of a continuity between those two things. Um, we'll uh, get into talking a little bit about uh, uh, cost functions once we set up sort of the uh, uh, the rudimentary version of um, uh, um, of, uh, of this process. Um, then we'll talk more about architectures. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can do uh, enhancement with neural nets. So uh, we're going to go through a bunch of the popular ones and, and see why certain things happen the way they happen. Uh, we'll talk about efficiency. Um, how can we make those things efficient so they can run on small machines, so they can run on a large scale and, and all those things. Uh, we'll talk about data efficiency. Uh, how do we deal when we, uh, how do we deal with a case where we don't have a lot of data um, or uh, constrained types of data? And then finally, if we have time for that, we'll also talk about uh, non-negative autoencoders, which are uh, sort of a different family of, of models that can allow us to do much more sophisticated processing uh, uh, than we would otherwise. Um, and then, you know, briefly, we'll try to wrap up everything uh, uh, at the end. Okay. Um, uh, a first request is that I would love it if you guys ask a lot of questions. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad question or a stupid question, so please don't be shy. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. If something doesn't make sense, do let me know. I've been doing those things for a while, so I take a lot of things for granted. Um, so I think it would be great if you, uh, um, uh, if you jump in and, and start a discussion. We have plenty of time, so that's not going to be a, a much of an issue. Um, so yeah, let's not make this be a, a sort of a one-way lecture. Um, uh, let, the more interactive it is, uh, you know, uh, the more information exchange we'll have. All right, so let's start with uh, part one, background. So what we're going to do at this part is we're going to talk just a little bit about the traditional uh, signal processing ways of, of doing things. We'll talk about uh, 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 basic uh, 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 frequency domain methods uh, for, for denoising. We'll talk a little bit about how we could uh, uh, sort of perform this type of denoising in the uh, 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 in the frequency domain, and then we'll sort of slowly try to transform that into a neural net, um, uh, so we can see how we have sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between things that we used to do forever, and 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 things which are um, uh, which are more modern now. So. Uh, a quick uh, uh, sort of recap of regular denoising. Um, there's a very long history of denoising in, in, in signal processing, of course. Um, historically, uh, the one way to uh, sort of approach this problem was by doing things like uh, a simple filtering. For example, if you have a lot of hiss in your recording, you apply a low-pass filter. If there's a lot of rumble, uh, you apply a high-pass filter. If there's like a humming sound, you can design a band reject filter that will uh, uh, focus on that particular band. Um, but of course, when you have much more no, uh, complicated noise patterns, you can't really make filters by hand, and we have to resort to, uh, uh, to slightly different methods. Um, of course, none of that processing usually happens in the time domain just because it's very complicated to, uh, to see what's going on there. Um, so instead, we're going to move to the frequency domain. So we're going to be seeing a lot of um, uh, spectrogram plots like this one. Um, the uh, color map is the darker something is, the more energy you have. And then, of course, we have frequency on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. Uh, so this is an example of a particularly noisy uh, uh, speech recording. Uh, let me play the sound so that you hear it. And I just want to verify, you guys get my computer audio, right? Yes. Yes, yes okay, thank yes, you. Yes, yes. All right. So, so what's nice with this representation, of course, is that you can see the noise uh, in this time frequency domain. We can see that there's a lot of uh, uh, high hiss at the top end. We can see that we have this uh, sort of a very prominent hum uh, uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the signal. And then we see all these wavy lines, which are, of course, the, uh, the speech signal, which uh, are really deeply buried inside the noise. <laughs> Is that a question or an unmuted mic? <laughs> okay. Um, 
So, uh, but, but removing this type of noise is not something that's trivial, of course. Um, it's going to require a lot of manual work. We can uh, uh, definitely make a whole bunch of filters that can address all of those frequency bands. Or if you're really patient, you can go in the uh, time frequency domain and sort of turn off all the time frequency bands which uh, uh, the noise dominates. Um, but these are, of course, uh, are not things anybody wants to do by hand. So the standard way of trying to, uh, to remove noise in the, those situations would be spectral subtraction. So it's a very, very well-known algorithm, very old algorithm. Uh, basically, every device that you're using has some version of it uh, uh, running for speech communications. Um, so the basic idea behind it is that we want to find what's kind of like the average spectrum of, of, of the noise that we have into our signal. Um, and then what we want to do is uh, effectively subtract the magnitudes of that spectrum from every uh, 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 spectrum in our spectrogram. That's the basic idea. So uh, in this particular case, what we would do is we would say, for example, well, we can see how at the beginning of the sound here, there's no speech. So if I were to take the average magnitude spectrum of that section of the sound, what I would get is effectively the spectrum of the noise because there's no speech in there. Um, and then the idea is that since the spectrum of that noise doesn't really change throughout time, what we can do is that we can take uh, that sort of average spectrum from that section and then subtract it from every column that we have in the spectrogram and that should suppress the noise. So that's the basic idea, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very simple uh, concept. So uh, formally, here's how it looks like. Um, your input is gonna be X, uh, so now we're looking at a, a spectrum at time T at a, a frequency omega. So we take the magnitude at that point, we subtract from it some amount of the noise spectrum that we've estimated, so N of omega is the spectrum of the noise. Um, and then what we do is we add in the phase of the original signal to construct a complex number, and then that complex number is going to be uh, the output uh, uh, time frequency representation for time t and, and frequency omega. So the only thing that we're doing is we're basically basically removing from the magnitude of our input the magnitude of the uh, uh, spectrum of the noise. Um, how much we remove the noise def uh, uh, depends on, on the parameter alpha. We can remove it a little bit or we can remove it a lot. Um, and of course, there's one extra uh, complication in that if we remove too much of the noise, then we're going to end up getting a negative value here. Um, and as far as magnitudes goes, if you have a negative value, you basically flip the sign of the signal uh, and it still ends up being loud. So if any number is less than zero, we effectively clip it to zero so we don't get any energy there. Uh, so by having that alpha parameter and tuning it, we can really remove a lot of frequencies, potentially hurting our, no our, our, our original signal, um, or, or we can just have something that's going to be very subtle. So how does this look like? Well, um, here's what happens when we do this uh, uh, to, uh, to the signal we have. Let me play again the noisy version to remind you. And then here's what happens when you uh, uh, do this method on, uh, uh, apply this uh, algorithm on this. So we can clearly hear some of the artifacts of uh, 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 all the filtering that happens, but as you can see, all those horizontal lines that were part of the uh, uh, humming noise are gone. All the high frequency components are mostly gone, and we're sort of left with these wavy patterns, which are uh, uh, effectively what the speech is. Um, so it can be a fairly powerful method uh, uh, if used correctly. Um, now, I've introduced it in sort of a very uh, uh, hacky way. This is not necessarily the way that uh, you want to think about it in DSP terms because it involves a lot of operations which are a little strange. Uh, you can also express that as a linear filter. Um, and, and the formulation behind that is that uh, your spectrum, the, the spectrum that you're observing at time t and at frequency uh, 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 omega um, is going to be approximately equal to the spectrum of the speech sound that you have plus the noise spectrum that, uh, that you're observing. Uh, so you're going to basically see those two things mixed. Um, and then we want to design a filter, uh, let's call that GT of omega, such that when I apply that filter on the magnitude spectrum of the sound that's coming in, I should be able to get an output which uh, cleans up the sound as much as possible. Now, the way that I uh, set it up that way is because historically in the signal processing, that's how, that's how we want to feel, we want to think about uh, filters, right? We're applying just a, a, a sort of a, an element wise multiplication uh, in the frequency domain, which is the convolution in the time domain. Um, now that filter G of T uh, is going to be a, a sort of a function of the noise spectrum that we've extracted and the input signal that's coming in. Uh, so we're sort of expanding it here like that. Um, and we can use different types of gain functions and that's going to give you different types of denoisers. Uh, the most basic one, which is the, uh, 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 the magnitude subtraction one, uh, 
is this one, where we define the GT of omega to be equal to one minus uh, the spectrum of the noise divided by the spectrum of the sound at that particular time. So if I were to take my input and multiply that with this particular filter, as I'm doing in, in, in this part of the equation, what would happen is that this x would go over here, it will cancel out with the denominator at this point, and what we're going to be left with inside is 1 minus uh, n of omega, which is uh, effectively the subtraction. So that's a way of seeing this filter as a, uh, this process as a, as a plain filter. So. Um, so basically, uh, the only thing we did is apply a linear filter. We had a little bit of a, a different process by doing this uh, clipping to zero, of course. Uh, but, but even if you don't, it can work well if you're careful with your, uh, with your alpha parameter. Um, and like I said before, this is the backbone of all speech denoising. Uh, the, there is no phone or, or, or device that doesn't use some version of this uh, 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 process uh, uh, today. Um, but the problem with that method is that it has a lot of limitations. Um, the filter itself is a constant filter. Um, it doesn't necessarily react uh, 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 to the input very well. Um, if you have a, a lot of changing characteristics in the noise, it wouldn't be able to, uh, to deal with that. Um, and it's not necessarily it's a filter that could be smart in terms of uh, jumping in and out or adjust its behavior uh, the way that we want to. Uh, and just to give you one example of uh, uh, something that could go wrong uh, uh, in a situation like this, here's an example where we have non-stationary noise. So as you can see on the left recording, we have this uh, uh, sound that keeps going up and down. That's a, a siren sound. And then we have a couple of sentences uh, uh, happening uh, uh, on top of that. Um, now what's going to happen is that as I'm learning the average spectrum of the noise as shown in the, uh, um, uh, on the left part of the left figure, what's going to happen is that that's going to tell me that you have a lot of energy in the noise between, uh, what is it, 500 hertz and 1500 hertz. Um, at any point in time, uh, the noise only has uh, just a very narrow frequency band that's active, but because we're averaging trying to get a better estimate, we're going to get something that tells us that this entire uh, 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 band, a set of bands is going to be full of noise. So when I try to get that spectrum of the noise, the average noise, and then subtract it from my data, what's going to happen is that this entire frequency range will seemingly be dominated by noise. If that gets removed by the signal, we're going to end up uh, uh, sort of removing a lot of speech in that section, which is not going to sound very good. So just to play the sounds, here's the input. The shelves were bare of both jam or crackers. A joy to every child is the swan boat. Um, and then here's what happens when we do the spectral subtraction. The shells were bare of both jam or crackers. A joy to every child is the swan boat. So that's really good at suppressing the noise, but if you're paying carefully, and hopefully the audio compression wasn't too bad, um, you'll notice that we're missing an entire frequency band from this uh, uh, recording, which kind of gives it this weird uh, uh, sort of, uh, 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 sort of uh, lack of resonance uh, in the signal. Um, so that's going to be our starting point to get into neural networks. Um, uh, what we want to do is come up with a denoising process that will be able to deal with uh, situations like this where uh, you do have a uh, very dynamically changing types of noises where we have to make a lot of sort of decisions uh, uh, in the process. So, um, and, and the way that we're going to do that is by using a fairly common story uh, uh, in the uh, um, in, in the last few years, uh, we're going to take this linear process that we defined, or you know, almost linear process that we defined, and we're going to try to sort of slowly turn it into a neural network by making it non-linear, by adding a depth to it, and by adding a lot of elements that will make it look more like a neural network and a little less than uh, than a regular filter. Um, sorry. Historically, yep. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, sorry, I, I raised my hand, but and now the slide is over. Um, so regarding the previous slide. Uh, so just a technical question. Um, when you remove the band, would you just take all of the frequencies and remove all of them or somehow detect the pattern and remove them? Kind of uh, no, the so, so what's going to happen is that in, in, in those frames that we have at the beginning, um, you will effectively get the power spectrum of that, of that region, right? Um, yeah. And that's going to look something like this. So it's not going to have a lot of energy at the top, maybe a little bit here, but then you get a big bump in this region. Right? And that's because 
you have all this energy moving up and down. So that thing averaged will effectively give you a spectrum that looks like the vertical line that, uh, um, uh, the vertical uh, graph that I put here. Now, if I were to take a spectrum like this and subtract it from every column that I have in my spectrogram, what will happen is that this frequency band will have something subtracted which is uh, bigger because it's gonna be uh, getting uh, this section uh, subtracted from it, all of the other frequency bands up here will have a smaller spectrum being subtracted from them. So they don't get influenced as much. So what you're seeing happening on the right plot is that all this section over here got this part of the, uh, um, whoops, this part of the input subtracted. So it's mostly obliterated except for the very loudest parts that happen to be above the threshold of however much I decided to remove it. And that's gonna depend on that alpha parameter that I mentioned. Okay. So okay. we're not necessarily removing all those frequencies. We're subtracting the spectrum of the noise, which has the effect of, of removing most of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we don't just take everything as one big block. We, we kind of try to, to get the right uh, values in this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, but yes, please keep asking questions and sometimes hard to see the, uh, the raised hands. So just, you know, feel free to jump in and, 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 and say something. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so that's, of course, is a very common uh, thing that happens a lot, uh, uh, taking a linear process and making it a neural network. And historically, it's always giving us uh, pretty good results. Um, so uh, it, it's a very, uh, uh, if, if you go to a lot of conferences nowadays, uh, you know, ICA Spinter speech that uh, deal with audio signal processing, you will see a lot of papers that, that kind of work like that. Sometimes people don't give you that train of thought, but it's something that, uh, that will help you understand things better. So even if you don't see it in a paper, it's a good, uh, good thing to try to figure it out. Um, so the reason why we want to make those processes a neural net is because now we're going to get uh, uh, all the benefits of it. For example, neural nets are nonlinear. They'll be able to give us things that a, a simple linear filter wouldn't be able to do uh, because we have depth. That means you can have much, much bigger parameter size, which means you can learn to do things which are more complicated. Uh, they're much more flexible because you can uh, uh, come up with architectures that, uh, that reuse weights or have certain structures that correspond to your data. Um, uh, so, so it makes things a little easier to, uh, to do things like that. So, um, and in order to get there, what we're gonna have to do is uh, change our notation a little bit and sort of move to a system that's gonna be a, 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 a bit more amenable to uh, sort of thinking of things as, as a neural network. So the original model that we had um, was that we have our, our input in this frequency domain, uh, we're applying a filter to it, and then uh, uh, that's gonna give us our output. So nothing special here, that's a straightforward DSP. Um, we're going to rewrite that using matrix notation, uh, just to sort of harmonize it with what people do in, a, in the neural net world. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say that, well, um, this particular frame <clears throat> um, is going to be a, 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 the spectrum at time t. We're going to take all of the frequencies at the same time. This is going to form a vector. So this is going to be our vector x of t, but we have all of the frequencies omega spread out uh, 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 as a column vector. Um, and then to apply this particular operation with matrix notation, what we effectively do is we're gonna take that vector and multiply it with a diagonal matrix where every diagonal element is gonna contain every omega element of the uh, gain filter that we talked about. And uh, if you multiply these two things together, so it's a diagonal matrix times a, a vector, we're effectively gonna be doing this element-wise multiplication and that will give us a vector that will have all of the frequency elements of the y of the, uh, uh, of the spectrum of the uh, of the outputs, um, and again, even more compactly, we could just uh, 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 note it as the uh, uh, last equation here. That vector x of t, which contains all of the frequencies at time t, multiplied by the matrix G, diagonal matrix G, will give us the vector y, which again contains the spectrum um, uh, of the output sound. Now, the reason why I want to write it that way because that we can use uh, to generalize and make it a neural network. And here's how we're going to do that. Uh, the original model is at the top. Uh, uh, input spectrum comes in one frame at a time. We're multiplying it with this diagonal matrix. Uh, we get the output spectrum. Um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to change that gain function. 
Uh, we're not going to have it change over time. It can be a constant now. Um, and we're going to make it a more complete linear transformation. Instead of saying that G has to be a diagonal matrix, uh, we're going to make it a full matrix. We'll call it W. And we're also going to add translation to it by having a B vector that we add to the end. So now we have a transform that can do all kinds of transformations, not just scale all of the elements. And it can also uh, uh, sort of translate our data by using this, uh, this bias term. Um, um, now, so now we're jumping from having uh, uh, sort of a, 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 a number of parameters, which is as many as the input, to having a, a square the number of parameters, or squared plus uh, the size. Um, to move more towards a neural network uh, 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 sort of architecture, what we can also do is add a nonlinearity. So when you look at a neural network node, it's effectively doing a linear transformation. And then we apply some kind of a saturating function. It could be a hyperbolic tangent, a logistic, a, a regular, or whatever. So we're going to do that as well. So now our filtering process moves to being this linear transform that we defined in the previous equation. But on top of it, there's an element-wise uh, nonlinear function that will give us the nonlinearity that we want. And then finally, what we're going to do is stack multiple of those layers uh, on top of each other. And that will allow us to, uh, um, to have sort of a, a deep network or a deep system uh, where now we can say, well, at the first level, level 0, um, our representation, we're going to call that h of t, is going to be equal to the input. And then we're going to take that and then figure out the next level of transformation. So we do a linear transformation. We put it through a, a nonlinearity. That's going to give us the next level of, of latent representation, um, h of i plus 1. And then we're going to put that in again in yet another layer and yet another layer. So we stack a bunch of those operations together. And whenever we had enough, we're going to take that output and say, OK, the final output uh, uh, h that we have is going to be what we uh, define to be our output. So this should be a fairly clean translation of the linear model that we started with um, uh, going all the way down to becoming uh, basically a, a pretty standard, uh, a very simple dense layer neural network. So any questions so far on how we made this uh, translation? All right. <clears throat> and by the way, that's something you can do with, with any linear system you want. Uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's very easy to do. All right, so, so the model we just defined is called a denoising autoencoder. Um, basically, it's a network for, uh, uh, to which you give a noisy input, and its job is to produce some kind of a clean signal uh, uh, coming out of it. Um, so conceptually, the way it's going to look is that you're going to get something like a noisy spectrogram. <clears throat> you're going to put that into your uh, uh, denoising autoencoder, which would be some kind of a neural network, and its job is to produce a clean, input, uh, a clean output uh, uh, out of it. Um, now, the exact structure that we're going to use um, is uh, informed by the way that we did the denoising before. So again, uh, to, to sort of show the same thing in more detail, uh, we have our input waveform coming in. We do a short time Fourier transform. That's going to give us the spectrogram. And then we're going to split that into two parts. We're going to have the magnitude part. So we're extracting the magnitude of that representation. And that's the plot you're seeing here <clears throat> on the top left. And then the magnitude is going to go through a, a sequence of, of nonlinear transformations, which are going to be different layers of our, uh, uh, of our network. And then at the end, they're going to give us something that we're going to call the new magnitude. And hopefully, that's going to be the magnitude of the denoised sound. At the same time, we're also extracting the phase of that uh, a spectrogram representation. Um, and that one just propagate all the way to the end. So we take the magnitude, we process it, we get something that should be the magnitude of the denoised uh, uh, sound, which is what you're seeing on the, uh, uh, on the right uh, uh, figure. And then we have to combine that new magnitude that we came up with with a phase of the original signal. Now, what that does is that it tells us that um, if, 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 the, uh, uh, if the output of the last layer did a good job at giving us a clean magnitude spectrum, all the parts where the noise was dominant would be suppressed. So we're not going to get a lot of noise. Um, what the phase is at those parts, we don't really care. Um, so by multiplying this magnitude with the original phase, we're basically just suppressing the parts that we don't want. And we put that into an inverse short time Fourier transform. And that's going to give us our output, which is going to be our, uh, uh, our denoised sound. So it's a fairly simple pipeline. If instead of having this sequence of nonlinear transformations, we just did the subtraction with the noise spectrum, we would effectively have uh, 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 the speckle subtraction algorithm. Um, so, so that's all there is to it. It's, it's not uh, much more complicated than that. Now, 
there's of course a difference in how we, uh, we learn the parameters for all of those uh, 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 networks that we have here. Um, uh, what we did before is that we had a section that we said, okay, this is only noise, and we use that to figure out the noise spectrum. Um, here we can't really do that because we're not subtracting a spectrum, we just have this uh, 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 very abstract notion of, of, of parameters that don't necessarily correspond to something uh, uh, physical in the signal. Um, so the way we're going to do that is by uh, a slightly different process, and of course it's going to be a typical neural network training uh, process. So we're going to uh, do the following. <clears throat> we're going to have to get uh, matching clean and noisy data. Um, <clears throat> now, this is impossible to get in real life. There's no way you can get data like that in real life because it's very difficult to get the exact uh, 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 signal that was part in a noisy, uh, that was inside a noisy recording. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a whole bunch of clean speech recordings, a uh, big data set, your, you know, LibreSpeech or Wall Street Journal or whatever, and then you can get a big connection of noise sounds as well. And what you can do is you can make artificial mixtures of those. You can take one random speech recording and then one random noise recording, add them together at some specified uh, 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 signal to noise ratio. And then you can say, this is going to be a noise recording. This is what's going to get uh, become the input to my network. Uh, and you can make as many of those as you want, uh, as long as you have enough data. Um, now, once you do that, you know that the ground truth for that particular mixture for the denoised sounds would be just the original speech recording that you used, right? So you already know what the clean sound sounds like, um, and you have a mixture that corresponds to that. So that means that now you also know what the target is. So you're going to use the speech to make a mixture, but you're also using that speech to have it be the clean target that you have. So now we have pairs of, of, of uh, uh, sort of noisy inputs and, and clean outputs, what you have to do is kind of string, the, uh, sort of use them as a data set, and then you train your uh, neural network to be able to figure out how to map uh, uh, a magnitude spectrum uh, uh, of a noise recording to the corresponding magnitude spectrum of the clean uh, uh, part of that recording. Um, how we do the training is, is pretty generic at this point. Uh, you know, we just use any of those millions of uh, gradient descent variants, uh, you know, uh, do your usual uh, uh, batch training, and then after a while, it takes a while to train those things, uh, you actually get something that, uh, that could be reasonable. <clears throat> now, how well does this thing work? Um, well, um, it can denoise fairly well uh, in a lot of challenging cases. Um, uh, so here's an example where we have a, a, a noisy input and then uh, what the network gave us as an output. This is just a single hidden layer network with the 1024 nodes, so it's not a, a big network, it's, it's actually a very small and simple one, uh, but just, just so you get a sense of how this sounds, uh, here it is. So here's the input sound. She had your dark suit and greasy wash water on here. Um, and then this is what comes as an output. She had your dark suit and greasy wash water all year. Right, so it's not perfect. We still hear a few artifacts, and you know we'll we'll, we'll be working on those later on. Uh, but it's even for such a simple thing, it actually does a pretty good job. Um, and you can actually see that. Um, well, this is not a very good example, but you don't really have stationary noise here because this sort of engine keeps revving. Um, it has no trouble dealing with that, which is nice. All right. Okay. May, may I ask one doubt? Of course. Can you hear? Okay. Uh, when you feed the network, do you do any kind of normalization? Or have you found it is useful to normalize the spectrogram before feeding? Um, at this point, we're not doing anything. Uh, we're going to get to that uh, later on. Uh, but for now, we're just getting a sort of a, a spectrum as it comes out from your, uh, you know, for your uh, favorite STFT function. Okay. okay. Final question. Yes. Uh, so the question is, um, how much denoising or twin products are speech content dependent? and how good it works in multi-speech noisy environment. Um, we will get into that later on. Right now, the model that I have is actually very uh, 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 very crude. It's only the, doing a very, very simple processing on, uh, on the spectrogram space. Um, this model can do, can surpass sort of the simple uh, 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 denoising technologies you would find today, but it's not that much better. Um, and, uh, and mind you, at this point, we're not doing any post-processing, we're not doing any pre-processing. Um, so this particular approach is not going to do much. Uh, but we're going to get to more complicated models uh, later on, and these will be able to address a lot of the uh, 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 sort of multi-talker situations and reverberant rooms and all those things. Uh, can I just confirm something? Um, so 
uh, once we denoise the spectrogram, do we use the noisy phase or do we also do something about the phase in this case? We, we, we use a noisy phase. Okay. Um, and, and the idea behind it is that if you have, for example, I don't know, this frequency bin here, which is uh, just noise, um, as soon as you set the magnitude to zero, the phase of that uh, particular bin doesn't really matter. Um, now, you will have uh, uh, situations where you have some of the noise coming in um, uh, in a frequency bin that also has voice, and that's going to give you some phase uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, artifacts. But for the most part, they're not that noticeable or, or not that extreme, um, unless you have a very strong correlation between your noise and, and the uh, uh, and the voice signal. So when you do the, the reverberation, for example, uh, uh, that becomes a little bit more of an issue. Um, but again, that's because we're still using this representation. Later on, we're going to end up with a representation that doesn't really use phase, uh, uh, so things are going to be a little different. Uh, but for now, we are using the noisy phase. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, um, she had. We didn't hear that again. <clears throat> so, so on paper, uh, here are the advantages that we get. Uh, we can deal with non-stationary noise uh, fairly well. We're going to see more examples of that later on. Um, the filter should be able to react to the input, so it's not just a passive filter that does the same thing over and over, and that's because we have more parameters and we can do more sophisticated stuff. Um, we can specialize on specific types of data. Um, so, for example, we can train our network to work best with our voice in a, in a specific environment um, as opposed to with, you know, everybody's voice, um, and that's going to make it perform better in this case. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the other uh, big advantage is that there's no estimation that has to happen during deployment. With, with a standard uh, um, uh, noise subtraction uh, denoiser, you have to periodically sample the noise and try to figure out what the noise looks like as it evolves over time. Um, uh, in this case, all of the heavy computation and sort of estimation happens in the training process, and then during inference time, you just have to do a forward pass over the network, and there's no estimation that happens at any point in time. And that, of course, makes the, uh, uh, the implementations uh, uh, a lot simpler. So, uh, to finish off with, uh, uh, with part one, um, we talked about how we can generalize uh, the noiser to become a neural net. Um, again, we get all the advantages of neural nets by doing something like that. Uh, but what I'd like you to do is always sort of look back to that model to try to figure out what it is that we're doing and how would it simplify in sort of uh, a, a traditional DSP. And those things are important because that can help us understand what the trade-offs are and uh, a lot of things like that. Um, so before we move on to the second part, do we have any questions? All right. So moving on, part two. <clears throat> so now we're going to sort of uh, keep doing that process and, and sort of take this idea a little further um, and uh, uh, go beyond just using a, a replacing a, a filter with a neural network. We're going to do a lot more than that. Um, so in general, what you'll notice uh, uh, in this talk and what you probably uh, figured out uh, by, by the previous lectures as well, um, if you have any kind of a DSP process, there's always some equivalent in the neural network world, um, and, and those two tend to be interchangeable. And the neural, in the DSP world, they end up being linear and sort of well understood processes. In the neural network world, they're sort of nonlinear, but they still have the same sort of underlying uh, uh, functionality. Um, so, so we're going to do now the same thing, but now we're going to look at the entire processing pipeline. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by looking at the uh, 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 sort of a standard uh, speech enhancement uh, uh, setup, um, and then sort of uh, see what, it's, uh, uh, what it contains, and then see how we can reimagine that as, a, as just a simple neural net. So the usual processing pipeline that we have with, uh, with uh, audio enhancement is that you have a signal that you don't like, uh, most of the time, you put it through some kind of a filter bank, for example, the short-time Fourier transform um, or the MDCT. Um, that includes a subsampling process. Um, then you do some kind of processing into that space. In the case of uh, uh, speckle subtraction, we're subtracting the noise spectrum. Um, and then you sort of inverse, uh, invert that uh, uh, frequency, time frequency representation, and you go back in the time domain, and that gives you the signal that you want. So, so this is pretty standard, whether you're trying to do the reverberation or denoising or source separation or, you know, a whole bunch of other tasks. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take that and change it to a uh, sort of a neural network. And the way we're going to do that is uh, by reinterpreting all of those parts. 
Um, and what we're going to say is that, well, you know what, what, what we call a filter bank in the, uh, um, in the signal processing world, it's actually a convolutional uh, neural network. Um, again, the filter bank, you're convolving with a bunch of filters. Um, in a convolutional network, you're convolving again with a bunch of filters. Um, the subsampling process that happens with a lot of those filter banks, that's something we could do with something like pooling or striding uh, in, in the neural network world. Again, same thing, uh, different terminology. The processing that we do in the middle, we could usually replace by doing some kind of a neural network. For example, the uh, uh, subtraction we did in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, speckle subtraction, we just replaced by a bunch of, uh, um, of, of simple layers. And then again, the upsampling we can do by undoing the max pooling or striding, and then we can have an inverse uh, uh, filter bank in the end. So each one of those steps effectively translates into a uh, uh, something that we know as a neural net term. Um, and so we can take uh, an entire signal processing pipeline and translate one, uh, you know, all of those steps one by one. And we're going to go from having this DSP uh, 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 sort of system into having just one big neural network that effectively does the same thing. So in, in the case we just uh, uh, examined, uh, here's what happens. We have the full denoising process. Um, which uh, uh, consists of the following. There is going to be a front end, and the front end is going to be using the short-term Fourier transform to get to the time frequency domain. And from that, we extract the magnitude and the phase, right? So this is what we do at the beginning. It's kind of like a fixed process. Then we have what we're going to call the processing step, um, uh, which is uh, uh, the part where we just apply the filter on, on the magnitudes. Uh, this is the denoising itself. And then once we do that, we're going to have to resynthesize, go back to the time domain. So we take the new denoised magnitude, we take the original phase of the signal, um, and then we use an inverse short time Fourier transform to get the output sound. So what happened in this case is that the only thing that we changed is the processing. That's the only thing that became a neural network uh, so far. Now what we're going to do is actually look at the front end and the resynthesis and try to make those be a neural network as well. Um, and we'll see how this will give us a, a few more advantages. So here's what happens. <clears throat> um, first, we're going to start with the front end. So what, what hap what's happening in the front end is that we're going to take uh, just a frame of sound from the input that's coming in. So we're going to take L samples uh, coming in from the input waveform. Um, we're going to multiply those with a tapering window, like a hand window or whatever you want to use. Uh, so which is standard for spectral analysis. So that's going to sort of uh, uh, give us a windowed uh, uh, frame of a signal. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, take the discrete Fourier transform of that. And that's going to give us uh, the spectrum of our signal at a particular time. So that's a single column in the spectrogram uh, that we used so far. So we're going to do that for multiple offsets of, uh, um, of our input. So that's going to give us our, uh, our transformation. So we're going to get a whole collection of Cs uh, that will uh, effectively be all the columns of the spectrogram. Now, again, we're going to try to make this, uh, uh, to rewrite this using linear algebra uh, uh, notation because that's going to allow us to think of it as a neural net. So we can rewrite this thing as what, what's called the sliding transform. Um, and the way that it's going to look is as follows. Um, we're going to construct a matrix T. Um, and what that matrix will have in every column is a, a, a sort of a small snippet of the input sound. So for example, uh, the first column of matrix T is going to be our input samples from the zeroth point to L minus one. So we have L samples um, in, in that particular uh, 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 column. Then we're going to move by H samples. That's going to be our hop size. And we're going to take uh, a next snippet of L samples uh, from an input sound. So that might be uh, sort of you know, the next part of the sound. And then we're going to do that again and again and again. Um, and we're going to take all those little snippets and organize them into one big matrix that's going to have uh, 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 sort of uh, L-sized uh, uh, parts of the original input in, in time order. Now, if I were to take that matrix and I multiply it with a diagonal matrix whose diagonal elements contain the window that we have here, uh, uh, what that will effectively do is multiply every element uh, uh, of each vector of our matrix with its corresponding element from the window. So by doing the multiplication of the diagonal window function with the matrix that contains all of our chopped up signal in, in smaller frames, we're effectively applying a window. And then if we multiply the result of that with the Fourier matrix, that's going to be a matrix that contains all the Fourier bases 
in its uh, in its rows that will effectively implement a discrete Fourier transform. So what you're seeing on the bottom equation is this big matrix C will be a matrix whose columns will be effectively those C of T columns that we have here. So we're doing exactly the same kind of operations, but on the bottom, we're using linear algebra. On the top, we're using more standard DSP notation. So the only thing we're doing is packing our sound into a matrix, and then we're using just a linear transformation that will contain a window and the Fourier transform together, and that will give us the spectrogram of our signal. Now, pictorially, how this looks like um, is as follows. Um, this is what a segmented input would look like. Every column that you see of, of, of this matrix contains a snippet of a waveform and neighboring columns basically have the same waveform shifted by a few samples. And that's why you see how it's got this uh, sort of a, a smeared structure uh, uh, when you look at it. That's because every column is similar to the column next to it, but there's a little bit of an offset. Um, so this is basically a time waveform uh, 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 cut into, uh, into individual frames. Um, this would be uh, sort of what the real part of a Fourier matrix would look like. So if you were to multiply this matrix uh, with that matrix, you will effectively take every basis that you have here, and you can see these are all sinusoids of different frequencies. So you would take every basis that you have uh, on that matrix and apply it on every column that you have, which is every snippet of the sound. If you do all of those things together, uh, here I'm plotting the magnitude of the output, you will effectively get a spectrogram. And here you can see that we have something like three different nodes and then, and then a chord. So it's just a different way of thinking about applying um, uh, 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 sort of a DSP by using linear algebra uh, formulations. A different way we can think of that <clears throat> is to think of sliding transforms as subsampled convolutions. So this is the formulation we used so far. We said that we have our uh, input, which is cut into small windows. We're multiplying that with a matrix that's going to apply the Fourier transform in the windowing, and that's going to give us a matrix that contains uh, uh, the time frequency representation. If you look at one column at a time, we're saying we're going to take one column of the big T matrix at a particular time. We're going to multiply that with that uh, transformation matrix. That's going to, again, apply the window and do the Fourier transform. And that's going to give us the spectrum of our sound at that particular time. And then if we expand this expression from vector notation to scalar notation, it's going to look like this. And what we're effectively doing here is we're saying that um, Let's take uh, a, a snippet of our input and convolve it with one of the bases that we have in this W matrix. That would be one of the Fourier bases. And then we're going to assign that uh, uh, to the output of a signal. So effectively, what we're doing is we're uh, doing a convolution uh, where the filters are going to be our Fourier filters. And that's going to give us our output, right? That's the very definition of, the, uh, uh, of a filter bank. Um, there's one small complication here. You might notice that I have a plus instead of a, of a minus. That's because for some reason that I don't understand in the neural network world, when people do convolutions in convolutional neural networks, they actually do correlations. That's because they started doing a lot of work with detection. So uh, whenever you see a minus sign, there should be a plus. Uh, that should, a plus sign, there should be a minus. Uh, bear in mind that I'm trying to keep the notation from the uh, neural network uh, uh, world. Um, so this linear product that we started with, it's effectively a, a set of convolutions. Um, now, if we also want to do the subsampling, uh, we can use that by doing what we call strided convolutions, where we only uh, uh, take every other output. You can explicitly have a decimation or resampling step after that, or you can do some kind of a pooling operation, which is very common in, in, uh, 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 in the neural network world. But the basic idea uh, that I want you to, uh, to, to sort of uh, uh, remember is that we could either think of the front end as being just a simple linear transformation, which we can implement with a simple linear dense layer as a neural network, or you can think of it as being a set of convolutions, which we can implement by using a convolutional layer. Uh, so these two things uh, are effectively doing the same thing, and it all depends on how you repackage your data. In this case, uh, we're using the row waveform as is. In this case, we had to repackage the row waveform in a format that would allow us to do the, uh, all the convolutions uh, by using a matrix multiplication. Um, so what that tells us is that what we have as a front end, that short-term Fourier transform, could be a neural network layer, either a, a convolutional layer or, or, or a simple dense layer if, if we uh, arrange our input like this. Now let's look at the rear synthesis as well. That's going to be a little different. Um, so the inverse, inverse transformation is a, a filter bank as well, uh, but now we're using the overlap add functionality, right? If we have a hop size, which is less than our window size, 
that means that we're going to have windows that overlap with each other. When we have to do the inverse uh, short time Fourier transform, we're going to have to overlap those uh, 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 those frames uh, to make sure we get a proper uh, uh, reconstruction. Um, you can't necessarily do that easily with a regular convolution, uh, but it turns out there's something called a transposed convolution in the neural net world, um, which also some people erroneously call deconvolution, which is not deconvolution. But the basic idea behind it is that it's trying to invert or being sort of the transpose operation of a regular convolution. And just to give you a sense of what it does to see how it relates with the short time Fourier transform, here's an example in the 2D space. Um, so we have an input. Uh, 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 that you can see in the in the blue uh, uh, sort of matrix on the left. We have a filter and then we have an output. Now, when you apply the convolution, what's going to happen is this two by two filter uh, will first get overlapped with this sort of uh, two by two subset in our data. Um, we're going to multiply all of the corresponding elements and take the dot product of all of those things. Um, and that's going to give you the first weight. Then you're going to take this filter again, and now you're going to apply it into those four elements. You're going to get uh, the dot product. That's going to give you this uh, element. Take it again, shift it by one sample uh, to the right. You're going to multiply it with those four. That gives you this element. And then do the same thing with the four squares that, uh, that are sort of in the, in the bottom two rows. And you're going to get these three elements as well. Um, so that's how the standard convolution works uh, in a neural network. The corresponding transpose convolution of that effectively changes the order, uh, 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 the, uh, the sizes of the input of, and the output. And what's going to happen when you do a transpose convolution is you're going to say, I'm still going to have the same filter. I could start by taking something uh, which is the same size as the output in the convolution operation. And now I'm going to take the first element of my input. I'm going to scale my filter by that one element. And I'm going to add the output of that to this section in my output data. And what that does is basically overlays the filter uh, in this location. Then I'm going to scale my filter by the second element and move it to the appropriate location, which is going to be this one. So now what happens is that these two samples get to be overlapped. And then we do the same thing for all the other parts. So if this was a one dimensional case, um, uh, the inputs and the outputs here would only have a single row. And what would happen is that you would do your regular convolutions on the left side, but when it's time to do the transpose convolution, you would take whatever coefficient you have at that point, filtering it will give you a, a time sequence which is a, a much longer, and then you would have basically overlap all of those sequences in the output. Whoops. And this is exactly what the inverse short time Fourier transform does. It takes your data and then it moves it's sort of a, a, your, your subsampled uh, uh, time frequency data, and then it uh, sort of translates them into time waveforms that get overlapped uh, uh, with each other. So why are we doing, yeah. I have a question, one slide before, please. Yes, the C is, um, is it complex? It's giving you the magnitude and phase or just magnitude? What, what right is it? Right now it's a complex number. It's a complex number, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, so now why do we do all these uh, uh, sort of math acrobatics, right? Well, um, both of the formulations that we used, whether it's a matrix multiplication or, or, or the convolutional layer, uh, are neural net blocks. And that, what that means is that we can rewrite the, uh, the entire denoising process as a big neural network. So again, what we had before was that we have an input, we do a short time Fourier transform, we get a magnitude and a phase, um, and then we have a sequence of, of neural network uh, uh, layers, and then we, uh, that gives us a new magnitude. Uh, we combine that with the original phase, we do a, an inverse short time Fourier transform, and we get an output. But now we can take that process and translate it, and we can say we're going to take our input, that the short time Fourier transform, I'm just going to replace with a, with a bank of conv convolutional filters because that's effectively what it's doing. Uh, we're going to do one uh, small difference. We're not going to take the magnitude in the face, but what we're going to do is we're going to take the output of that and put it through a series of, of linear transformation, of uh, nonlinear transformations, which is similar to what we did before. And then whatever comes out of it, we're going to multiply it with what the original representation was. We get a tra transpose convolution that would be the equivalent of the short of the inverse short time Fourier transform, and that will give us the waveform. And by doing all of this processing, uh, what's happening is that we don't have any DSP element or any traditional DSP element left into this. Uh, we basically have a sequence of uh, we have one big neural network that receives raw audio coming in and gives us raw audio coming out, uh, which makes things very very convenient. Now. There's a couple of things that I slipped under the rug here, so let's look at them. There is a difference in the front end. <clears throat> um, we don't use complex values anymore. 
So what we did with the short-term Fourier transform is that uh, we had all these uh, uh, complex numbers coming out of it. We would take the magnitude because we know it makes sense to operate in that. And then we would take the phase because uh, we don't care about its effects uh, in the noising as much and then process things uh, the way they were. Um, we're not gonna do that now. Now we're just gonna have a convolutional layer. Uh, the whole point is to train the uh, basis functions to optimally do denoising, so we don't necessarily have to preload it with Fourier functions. So what we're gonna do is we're not gonna extract magnitude and phase anymore. We're just gonna pass the signal as is directly to a, a sequence of layers uh, for processing, but also keep that representation and pass it over uh, uh, toward the end. Now, is that okay? Well. It is okay, it, it actually works well. Um, uh, the reason why we do it is that uh, when you operate with neural networks in the complex domain, uh, the math is a little different. Um, you have to be careful about a whole bunch of uh, uh, sort of minima that don't exist in the real uh, uh, space. Uh, and also on a practical note, it's very difficult to do complex valued logic with a lot of the uh, uh, deep learning frameworks which are out there. Um, uh, but the other reason is that we don't want to be uh, uh, constraining things with a representation that, that we like, right? Uh, the short-term Fourier transform is great, but it's not necessarily optimal for we, what we want to do. So we want to let the network uh, figure th uh, things out on its own. Now, like I said before, the polar representation that we use with magnitude and, and phase is actually very intuitive and very easy to, uh, uh, to work with. Um, but if we really wanted to get something like that, or if something like that was necessary, you can imagine that all of these uh, nonlinear layers that we have here uh, would be able to actually extract magnitude out of those operations or something that's would be, uh, that we could be combined over here to give us the same effect. So we're not necessarily losing that functionality. It's something that gets hidden inside the uh, nonlinear processing that happens uh, uh, otherwise. Um, we could also say that, well, we're not doing an STFT, we're doing something like an MDCT, in which case uh, it's kind of moot talking about magnitudes and phases. Uh, but either way, we don't have to use complex values. Um, they are convenient when it comes to making plots and, and interpreting results. Um, uh, but, but again, they're not something that we need. Um, <clears throat> So, and what that means on the resynthesis side is that we're not modulating phases anymore. We're not taking a new denoised magnitude and then using the original phases and combining things together. Instead, what we call, we use what we call a skip connection in the neural net world, um, and we do what we call masking. So we're gonna basically take the representation that was the original representation of our data, and we're gonna do some kind of, a ma of masking here that uh, suppresses some elements, uh, or, or, or appropriately scales others, and then that's what's going to be given to our uh, uh, transpose convolution for the resynthesis uh, step. Now, these are both in some sense similar. Here we're multiplying the magnitudes with the uh, 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 just the phases of, of the signal. What we're saying here is that we're going to have some kind of a latent representation that will act as a gate to the original latent representation. So there is an equivalence between those two, but it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, so now you might be asking, well, yeah, but is, is, is masking something that's okay? Is that something that's, uh, 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 that's appropriate? Well, masking is actually a pretty powerful tool. So just to give you a little sense of, of, of what you can do with masking, and we're going to do that in the, in the short time Fourier transform space, but, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be. Um, here's an example of, uh, of two people speaking at the same time. I she had your dark suit in greasy wash water all hole. year. Now, if for some reason that was the representation that a neural network was using, um, what masking would effectively do is we'd have to look at every pixel in that spectrogram and say, does this belong in source one or does that belong in source two? And we could make a binary mask such that when you do this operation here, you'd effectively mute a particular uh, 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 pixel uh, and let it go through or not in the resynthesis. Um, <clears throat> so, Again, we're not going to sort of uh, uh, do this by hand, of course. We're hoping that the neural network would do something like this. But for now, let's consider, consider the Oracle case. And the Oracle case is the case where we know the answer and we're just seeing if this process works. So what I can do is I, I can artificially say, well, let me make a binary mask for which if the spectrum of my first sound is louder than the spectrum of my second sound, it's going to be a one. If not, it's going to be a zero, right? So this is the case where one speaker is louder than the other speaker. In this case, it's an Oracle case. I know exactly what the solution is. I'm just making a mask because I know that. And here's a mask uh, where the second source is larger than the first source. Now, if I were to take these two functions and apply them on the spectrogram, I would effectively be doing this kind of thing. 
assuming that the bases were spectrum bases. Um, and if you do that, uh, here's what comes out. So here's the mixture again to people speaking. I you had your dark suit in greasy wash water all hole. year. Here's what happens when you multiply the first mask with the representation that we have. She had your dark suit in greasy wash water all year. And the same thing for the second mask. I assume moisture will damage this ship's hull. Now, we do get some phasing artifacts and stuff like that, but the basic idea behind it is that just by turning on and off simple coefficients in your latent presentation, we'll be able to give you a, 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 a pretty good reconstruction of what you want. Now, there's going to be an extra element added here in that we're not going to be using Fourier bases anymore, right? We're going to be using bases that are being learned. So that means that the network has the flexibility to learn the optimal domain to do this kind of masking. Um, so what you're seeing here is kind of like a, a, a sort of, a, in some sense, kind of like a lower bound uh, to the performance we should, we should expect to get. So, so there's nothing wrong with masking, uh, and it's actually very closely related to uh, the uh, uh, phase modulation we did before. So now the question is, are all of these changes a good idea? Uh, well, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, one element, one, one sort of a positive element here is that this really frees us from a lot of uh, uh, user-selected transformations. Um, a lot of the times when my job is to figure out how to, what, what kind of algorithm to use to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do my processing, I would have to make a choice. Do I want to use a short time Fourier transform? How big do I want my windows to be? What's the hop size? Do I need to use wavelets? Do I do a constant Q transform, an empty CT? Um, in this case, it's not going to matter. We're just going to say there's a bunch of filters, and the neural network will have to figure out what's the best way of dealing with it. Um, so we don't have to sort of impose any kind of, uh, of, of, of bias on, on what the uh, latent space will be like. Um, it also helps us minimize a lot of the parameter selection. Uh, we only have to decide how many bases we have. Um, we don't have to worry about what kind of window to use uh, or hop size and st stuff like that. That all gets automatically sorted out uh, in the process. Um, and of course, when you do that, yes, the results do tend to be better. Um, <clears throat> Um, it's, of course, going to be a lot more computationally expensive. We won't be able to use uh, efficient uh, fast free transforms and, you know, all these wonderful tools that, uh, that make things fast. Um, but we'll be able to learn uh, transformations which are specifically tailored for the data and the task that we're working on. Um, so even though it takes a lot more processing, it's probably not that big of a deal. Um, there's also a data processing advantage from uh, sort of an architecture standpoint, which is that when you think of things as a neural networks, as a neural network, you're uh, effectively making the processing pipeline very homogeneous. That means that uh, all of the operations that we do boil down to being a matrix product with, with a nonlinearity on top of it. Um, and that makes things a lot simpler. Um, if, if any of you had the, uh, uh, the joy or, or lack of, of uh, sort of implementing things on a DSP chip, you know, you always had to like worry about, okay, what's the right way to implement the filter? What's the right way to implement the Fourier transform? And there's like all these specialized uh, uh, hardware elements that will help you do those things. Um, now you don't have to worry about that anymore because a lot of the neural net pipeline is, is pretty much the same operation. It's just matrix multiplications over and over and over and over. Um, so that means that if you want to design hardware, you basically have to worry about just one thing, uh, uh, matrix products and, and nothing else. Um, so uh, when it comes to deployment, and we'll be talking about that in a minute, it's going to make hardware design uh, uh, much, much easier. Um, so we only need to fine tune one type of computation. So uh, to wrap up uh, uh, this section, um, the entire DSP sort of pipeline that we have, we can reimagine as a neural network layer. Um, so now we have what we call an end-to-end -end audio system. That means that we have raw audio coming in and raw audio is coming out. There's no notion of pre-processing or post-processing. These things have become adaptive layers. Um, and, and, and what's the huge advantage of that is that we have a fully differentiable system. That means that we can say, well, here's the input that I have, here's the output that I have, just optimize the entire processing pipeline. We don't have to, to do anything that's, uh, uh, that, that we have to design ourselves. Everything can be adapted uh, for this task. Um, and of course, it simplifies the processing a lot in both software and, and hardware. Right, so that's the end of the second part. And I'd like to know if we have any questions before we move on. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, so when we use the spectral subtract uh, DSP-based uh, enhancement method, 
so we got some artifacts like right but when we use the denoising auto encoder do we still get the artifacts or uh, or is it like it's lesser in neural network based enhancement or it's more in signal processing based enhancement um so so the reason why we get artifacts in the um um, uh, in sort of the DSP approach is because we have uh, an effect called the musical noise. Uh, and let me see if I can get to my slides at that point. Uh, let's see, maybe we can see a little bit, a bit of here. Actually, there's another example further up. There we go. <clears throat> so, so this is the first example that I've shown where we're doing denoising. <clears throat> Um, and what you'll notice is that there are certain parts of the noise that actually went through because we didn't subtract from them enough uh, of the noise spectrum. Um, what that means is that at, at this point in time, you're basically going to get a single sinusoid. It's going to turn off. It's going to turn off. Um, and that creates what's called a musical noise. I don't know if we can hear it very well in this example. Let's see. So there's a little bit of twinkling sound that you can hear, uh, not so much in this case, <clears throat> but if you're not careful, that's a, 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 a very typical artifact. Now, the reason why we get that artifact is because we have a, 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 an operation that does something very specific, and that's a side effect of that operation. Now, when we go back to the neural network uh, methods, um, mm -hmm. what happens in this case is we have a pipeline that looks like this. Yeah. Oops, let's get a, the whole thing. <clears throat> And now what we're doing is we're optimizing from beginning to end to get something that sounds good. And what that means is that the neural network has to figure out what's the right domain and what's the right operation in that domain such that we get exactly what my user wanted. So we're not going to get the same type of artifacts because we're not introducing a process that creates those artifacts. What we're saying is that to the neural network is, look, here's the data. I want you to give me something that sounds as, as good as you can. Um, and you have to figure out all the post-processing yourself such that it sounds like that. So the only artifacts you're going to get are going to be because you don't have proper uh, training data or because your architect architecture might not be powerful enough, but they're not going to be processing artifacts, not in the same way that you get in the DSP world. Okay. Sorry. Following this, I have another question. So mm -hmm. for example, if we do not have the enough data to train the neural network based enhancement method, and if I train my model on the one data set and test it on the another data set, so is like they're likely to get the more artifacts than uh, signal processing based enhancement? Um, <clears throat> it, it could potentially happen. Um, one thing I'd like to note is that if you're dealing with, you know, ordinary uh, situations with uh, stationary noise, like, you know, right now in my office, yeah, there's some fan noise or AC noise or whatever, I would not use a neural network to, to, to remove noise in this environment. It would be overkill. Um, if you have simple stationary noise, just, you know, use the DSP stuff. It works, it's been fine-tuned, it's, it's not bad. Um, so um, for more complicated uh, situations, um, uh, yes, if there's a mismatch between your training data and your deployment data, obviously you're going to get uh, 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 not as good performance as if you had better matching. Uh, but also the results you're getting at that point are so much better than what you would get from speckle subtraction that it's kind of an uneven comparison. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about data efficiency uh, uh, later on. Um, but again, depending on the type of sounds that you have, on the type of interference that you have, on the type of process, maybe you want to do uh, the reverberation, right? So, you know, I'm sort of showing all those things in the context of denoising, but I might as well say I have reverberance sound coming in and clean sound coming out, right? It would be the same process. Um, so again, depending on what you're trying to do, how your data looks like, how big your network is, and all those things, uh, or how you regularize, um, you will have different uh, types of artifacts but they're not going to be as predictable as with standard DSP algorithms. And that is the price of playing with neural networks. You can't predict what's going to happen, right? You just try it, and if yeah. it works, it works, and you publish a paper, but you still don't know why it works. Whereas with DSP, uh, that's not the case. Yeah, that's true. Thank you so much for answering sure. this. Uh, but we'll be touching on some of those things uh, 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 later on as well. So it's uh, uh, good questions. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, I have one question. Yep. Uh, in this application, uh, the initialization of weights, if they are uh, close to zero, 
uh, it can make uh, it can work, or you have to apply some different technique to convert faster or make it more efficient. Um, I, I've almost never had to worry about uh, weight initialization in uh, in those kinds of models. Um, if you use the standard uh, uh, ways of initializing, they they work just fine. Okay. Um, so it's not a big deal. Um, later on, if we have time, we're going to talk about a different family of models where where weight initialization actually matters a little bit. Uh, but for these models, it's it's not that big of a deal. Um, okay. The other thing I would like to note is that. Uh, a lot of cases you can start with something that you know works well. So for example, what we did uh, so far is we said, look, the SDFT is effectively a, a, a bank of convolutional filters, right? Um, when I say that, that means that I could probably take the Fourier bases and put them as the initial conditions for my network, and it's going to start me from a pretty good uh, uh, representation. So um, a, a, a lot of people early on were doing things like that, where they would just take uh, something like a DCT coefficients, uh, preload them as the initial weights for the transformation, do the same thing for the inverse DCT on the other side, um, and that would speed things up a lot um, if you had the same sort of sizes for your networks. So there's ways to get smarter initialization, but you know, either way, you're gonna have to wait a few hours for this thing to uh, uh, to train anyway. So you know, if you wait for 10 more minutes for the weights to convert to, to find the way, it's not gonna make a huge difference. But you're not gonna get very uh, bad uh, uh, sort of local optima that you have to worry about those things. Okay, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, so let's do the third section. Maybe then we could take a break, or should we take a break now? Any opinions? I think uh, you can decide whether we have right. to take a break now or later. Something okay, else. well, let's, let's finish the next section, part three, and then we can, uh, we can take a break. <clears throat> okay, great. All right. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> so part three. Now we have the question of what do we have to optimize? And, and you know, this is one of those questions which is uh, uh, crucial and probably the most important question that, that you have to worry about, uh, even more so than architectures and things like that. So uh, on the top, you have my, one of my favorite quotes uh, that I was being told constantly in, in grad school that everything is optimal given the right criteria. So. Whenever you make an algorithm and you use your, I don't know, mean squared error cost function or something, um, uh, and then you don't like the results, um, the answer is not that the results are bad. The, your results are optimal. It's just that the cost function that you use was the wrong one. So especially with neural networks, that is something that's very, very important because uh, we have a choice of optimizing a, wide, a very wide range of, 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 of loss functions, and we have to know which one we have to optimize in order to get the best results that we want. So this section is about uh, discussing all of those things. So um, here's what we did so far. <clears throat> uh, the original model um, did a very straightforward optimization. Um, when we operated in the, uh, without the, pre -pro the uh, convolutional layers in the front and the back, what we said is, well, let's take the output of the network, uh, 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 ZFT, and, uh, or whatever the target, and then subtract, take the sort of the mean squared difference between uh, the output of the network and the intended target, and that's gonna be a loss function, right? So we're doing a mean squared error in the frequency domain. Or if you have the convolutional layers, you could do a mean squared error in the time domain. And that's kind of like the first cost function everybody uses to, to you know, uh, for, for a lot of problems, or reg regression type problems. Um, uh, and then the question becomes, are those okay? Well, you know, mean squared to error is very common in DSP, but the reason why it's common is because it makes all the math very, very simple. Um, um, it, it has a lot of properties that, uh, th that make life easy. Uh, but that's not necessarily, uh, what we need uh, uh, in our case. So for example, it would be very easy for us to say, instead of uh, uh, doing the L2 distance, we could do an L1. Would that make a difference? And yes, it does make a difference, uh, but then the question becomes, why is that better or, or, or worse? I mean, we can see that it might give you better results, but then again, then again we need to have a way of, of justifying uh, why this is the case. So when it comes to evaluating separation or, or denoising or you know any other uh, uh, task, even, uh, you know, enhancement task, the reverberation, or echo removal, or whatever, um, it is always very important to know what matters. Um, and I can't imagine a single case where doing something like a minimum uh, MSE error as being the right thing. It's the easy thing, it's the obvious thing, 
it's just not the right thing. So the other thing to note is that what really matters is going to relate to your goals. Um, some people try to do uh, uh, denoising or source separation because you want it to sound good. Uh, that means that you ultimately have to satisfy somebody's ear. Um, some people want that because they want the output uh, speech to sound intelligible because somebody has to understand what's being said. Maybe it doesn't sound good, maybe there's still some noise, but if you improve the intelligibility, um, that could be what you care about. And that might sound a lot different from something that's designed to completely suppress the noise. Um, or maybe you want to facilitate further processing. Maybe that's a pre-processing step to put into your automatic speech recognition system, in which case you have to worry about that. Um, so, and you have to make a lot of choices. Uh, uh, do I want to completely remove the noise and, and have some artifacts or do I want to keep some of the noise and maybe not have artifacts? Uh, these are all choices that you, there's no right answer to. It's going to depend on your application. It's going to depend on your taste. So it's, it's not something that I can tell you, you know, this is the way to do it. Um, uh, but these are valid concerns and how you optimize your neural network is going to reflect that and you want to be able to, to, to do this. So, <clears throat> Uh, so first thing we want to do is we're going to go uh, for say, let's say we go for maximal separation. If we really care about source separation of, of sort of separating the noise from, uh, from speech, um, our goal is to suppress the noise as much as we can. And we also want to minimize any artifacts that we get from reconstruction. Um, and there's a very famous uh, uh, toolkit called the BSS eval that gives us a set of metrics that, uh, that are very good uh, for doing this kind of processing. Um, we have the uh, 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 three metrics defined in this case, uh, the SIR, the SAR, and the SDR. That's source to interference ratio, source to artifacts ratio, and source to distortion ratio. Um, and these basically measure a lot of the things that we want. So to give you a sense of what they look like, uh, the source to interference ratio, or SIR, is kind of equivalent to what we would call the uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. In some sense, it measures the, uh, 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 how much of the interference is left in the output uh, that we have. Uh, what it effectively does is a whole bunch of inner products. And what we're trying to figure out is how much of the original noise. Uh, so, uh, so we have um, X is going to be our output of the network. Y is the ground truth of the target. And Z is the ground truth of the interference. So Z is the noise that we already know what it's, uh, it's like. Uh, y is the signal we want to get as an output, the target signal, and X is the output of the network. Having those three values and arranging them this way um, it will give us a number that will get maximized the more you suppress uh, a Z inside signal X. Um, we always show that in the decibels, the larger the number it is, the better. If you get anything more than 10, 15 decibels, it actually sounds pretty good. Um, and if we want to make that a neural net loss, we want something that's minimizable. So we can take that maximization that we have here and simplify it a little bit. So we're basically flipping the, uh, um, uh, the ratio and then removing some of the constant terms. Um, and it ends up like a loss function that looks like this. We want to minimize the correlation with noise, which is what the uh, numerator does. And we want to maximize the correlation with the target, which is what the denominator does. If we optimize this ratio, we're effectively optimizing the source to interference ratio. So that's going to minimize the, the, the target, the uh, interference as much as it can while keeping the target intact. There's the source to artifacts ratio, a little bit of a more complicated uh, uh, expression. Uh, but what that does is it measures how much, uh, how many artifacts have we introduced into our signal. Um, when you get an output, you will have some amount of your signal, you will have some amount of remaining noise, and then you will have some amount of artifacts that the processing introduces. What SAR does is uh, measure the amount of artifacts. What SIR did in the previous slide, measure the amount of remaining noise. Um, again, this is measured in dB, larger values are better. And again, we can sort of stare at it for a while and do some math to simplify it. And if you want to make it a neural net loss where you have to minimize it, it's going to look like this. Um, I'm not going to really try, going to try to explain it because it's not that easy. Um, uh, but this basically, uh, it's something that we can easily optimize. It's just a bunch of dot products. And then finally, there's the source to distortion ratio, um, which in some sense combines the signal to interference and the signal uh, and the source to distort to. Uh, um, oops, that should be SAR up here. Uh, 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 so it combines the uh, SIR and the SDR into one thing. <clears throat> uh, uh, so uh, we can use that as a single measure that basically takes the two other measures and tells us how well, how well we do. Again, it's just a bunch of dot products. And if we simplify them as a neural net loss, uh, it looks very simple. Um, and what it tells us is that we want to minimize 
uh, uh, the output that comes from the network while maximizing the correlation with the target. So it's a very simple expression. It says, make the signal as similar as you can to the target. At the same time, make sure it's not just a zero uh, uh, or a very faint signal. Um, so this is a cost that you can use, uh, fairly simple, very easy cost to, uh, uh, to differentiate and put into your own network. Um, uh, uh, and that can work uh, uh, really well. Um, now, another uh, avenue you can take is to say, well, you know what? We really care about intelligibility. I'm doing this for speech. People are going to listen to that. I want to make sure that they can, they, they know what they can, uh, they can understand what's being said. And that might mean that you still let some noise or maybe you let some artifacts go through as long as that uh, intelligibility is not gone. Um, so uh, BSS Evolve uh, is not going to help you do something like this. Its job is to reduce noise. Um, uh, uh, and, and artifacts, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's going to give you something that's going to be uh, uh, as uh, intelligible as possible. So an alternative measure to that is uh, the STOI uh, measure uh, uh, that stands for short time objective intelligibility. So it's a measure that basically spans from uh, zero to one. Zero means that you have no idea what's being said. One means that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the sound that you have is actually quite intelligible. Um, if we're sort of sketching it a little bit as an algorithm, the way that it's going to look like is that, again, it's got this uh, short time Fourier transform. Uh, it's got some octave band representation of the data up to 10 kilohertz. Um, and then you're computing some local correlations and sort of average them over the entire uh, uh, signal. Um, uh, and those give you an indication of how much intelligibility exists into the signal. Um, again, this is something that people came up with by sort of correlating it with human perception. So. Uh, you know, don't 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 try to make too much sense about why it works, but there's, there's uh, you, you can show that it actually correlates well with how people feel about intelligibility. So you can use it as a as a computational proxy to that. Um, now, what's a nice property of that is that if you look at what it uh, entails, there's an STFT, there's uh, some octave band, there's some correlation. As we've seen before, all of those things can be seen as neural network elements, right? We can combine them and make them a neural network which means the entire thing is differentiable. So you can actually sit down and implement uh, a STOI as a neural network with, with fixed weights. Um, and then that means you can compute its gradients, which means now it can be a cost function uh, that you can use uh, for your neural network. So, so one of the advantages of doing this end-to-end -end network that we did in the previous section is that because we're using waveform level uh, uh, processing, we have an input waveform coming in and an output waveform coming out. Any kind of cost function you can apply on, on waveforms, whether it's your SNR or your STOI or whatever else, now you can implement, you, you can optimize as a cost function. Um, so the reason why we did all this uh, bothering of, of sort of figuring out how to replace the, the Fourier transforms is not only to get a better uh, type of representation, but also because that allows us to, uh, to, to operate metrics directly on the waveform, which is what most of the standard metrics are on. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, which uh, loss matters the most? Well, you know, again, like I said before, there's no right answer here. Um, uh, a lot of papers report one of those measures, either most usually the SDR, a lot of the times maybe they care about STOI. Uh, you can also use other ones like, you know, PESC or PEAK or uh, whatever measure uh, works well for your, uh, for your space. Um, but uh, one thing we wanted to figure out, uh, we did sort of did a little experiment in my group at some point, <clears throat> is we made a listening experiment and tried to figure out how do people feel about different questions and how they relate to different cost functions. Um, so what we did in this case is we had a set of four uh, questions and then we trained simple neural net, denoising neural networks with different cost functions and we wanted to figure out where do you get more correlation. Um, so, uh, so here's the answer that we got. So again, that's sort of more informative to show you that different um, tasks have uh, you know, required different things. Um, so one question is, how much was the interfering source suppressed? So we put this on Mechanical Turk. We asked uh, hundreds of people, uh, you know, what they thought about a whole bunch of, of separation results. Um, and here what you're seeing is the rating that people gave to different cost functions uh, to sounds uh, that we got through different cost functions. So for example, we trained a neural network using mean squared error. And then we see that the mean opinion score was about, I don't know, 50%. Um, and then we trained another network where we said the cost function would be 50% the SIR, another 50% SAR. And we see that people felt that that uh, resulted in interfering the sources, uh, in, 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 sorry, in resulted in uh, suppressing noise uh, much better than the mean squared error network um, or the SDR network. So 
uh, we see for that particular question, for that particular goal, that the cost function we want to use would be uh, the average of the SIR and the SAR. Now, if we change the question and say, how, how intelligible was the separated speech, things change. What we used before that gives us the most noise suppression doesn't necessarily give you the best intelligible speech. And that we actually got by uh, balancing, uh, what is it, about 75% the SDR and 25% of STOI. So now we're introducing a cost function that actually cares about uh, uh, intelligibility. Um, so we can see again, that's different. And again, the MSC does not give you the best results, even though it's kind of like the standard thing to do. Uh, listening test number three, we asked people how well was the target source preserved? And that means, you know, do, are we introducing a lot of artifacts uh, or not? Uh, turns out again, a combination of STR and STOI tends to do better. And then the last question was, uh, um, how inaudible were the artifacts? Um, uh, so again, in this case, uh, turns out that using just the SDR uh, is much better, but uh, overall there wasn't as much variation as we had before. So. So what those uh, tests tell us is that there's no right cost function um, for, uh, for what it is you're trying to do. That's gonna depend heavily on what your goal is. And if you don't know what your goal is before you start uh, doing this, then you know, don't do it. Figure out what you wanna do. And once you figure it out, then you know what kind of, uh, uh, of cost function you need to use and how you need to optimize things. Um, uh, another question you might wanna ask is, okay, so what's going on with the, uh, the ASR? Well. Um, if you want to do automatic speech recognition, a lot of separation, it's well known that a lot of separation algorithms do not help ASR. Um, there's a lot of inaudible changes, a lot of changes in the statistics of the, of the speech signals that come out of those um, uh, that will actually uh, uh, confuse models. Um, ASR systems do not necessarily work the same way that our ears work. They latch on features which we might think are not necessarily important. Um, so if you apply a separation algorithm before an ASR system, most of the time it actually makes things worse. Um, unless you, design, you, you train that ASR system with the noise data, but that's usually very expensive. Um, so what you can do is you can use a lot of the ASR metrics as a loss for the denoiser. Um, so that means that you can train the, uh, um, uh, your automatic speech recognition system in tandem with a denoiser and then optimize the denoiser to facilitate recognition. Uh, of course, that requires a, a, you know, a, a, a training from the, uh, scratch. Uh, or the other thing you can do is you can optimize a denoiser to minimize uh, uh, word recognition uh, uh, metrics. So you can take your, your noise signals, put them through a denoiser, then put them through an uh, ASR system uh, that only spits out your, uh, let's say your word error rate, and then can use that as a, as a cost function for your denoiser and try to optimize it such that it optimizes the, uh, the performance of the ASR system, not necessarily uh, uh, you know, how it sounds or, or any of the other metrics. Um, and again, that's fairly easy to do because now a lot of the ASR systems are just a big neural net. Um, <clears throat> you can also use a lot of perceived quality measures. Sometimes people care about how good something sounds or what the fidelity uh, looks like. Um, um, and that's irrespective of, of, of denoising and, and other things. Um, and again, you can use a lot of standard uh, tools for that. You can use something like PESC, uh, uh, which is a, again, a sort of a, a computational a function that basically uh, approximates how people would per uh, perceptually evaluate speech quality. Uh, the speak, same thing for general audio. There's a whole bunch of, uh, of metrics that people come up with in, in, in quality assessment. Uh, most of them use very standard uh, signal processing uh, uh, elements. Uh, and it's very straight, straightforward to, uh, uh, to turn them into a neural network and then use those as a cost function uh, by itself. Uh, one final thing about cost functions. Um, there's also a very strong distinction between denoising versus separation. Um, when we talk about denoising, you have a, a, a mixture of sounds uh, and then there's one sound that you want and everything else is considered to be the sound that you don't want. So it's kind of like a binary problem. Um, uh, that's kind of a, a fairly simple problem and that we could easily address with a lot of the uh, uh, metrics we had in the previous slides. Uh, but then there's interesting situations where you want to do, for example, separation of, uh, of two speakers speaking at the same time. So, you know, uh, if, if you have two people speaking at the same time, um, then it's not clear and you want to separate both of those audio streams, it's not clear what is the noise and what is the target, right? Because both of these signals are a target and you need to be able to extract both of them uh, uh, just as well. 
Now, the problem with those, those situations is because you don't have a clear definition of what constitutes a target and what constitutes uh, uh, an interference, we cannot use the same losses as we did before. And here's the reason why. Um, imagine that you're training a neural network and you're randomly giving it uh, mixtures of, of, of speakers. Uh, and then you try to extract, let's say, the, uh, the first speaker uh, out of those mixtures and train it that way. Well, if you were to do something like this, um, at some point you might get a uh, sentence S1 and then that gets mixed with sentence S2 and you ask your neural network to optimize itself to give you as an output just S1. Um, sometime later on, you might also get a mixture of S2 plus S1, which is going to be exactly the same input, but now the first source becomes uh, S2 and now you're asking it to give you S2. What would happen in those cases, you would get one gradient that tells, oh, you want to give me S1. The other gradient says, oh, you want to get S2. And those two would basically cancel each other out. Um, so you would be asking your network to do something impossible, which to give you two different outputs uh, for effectively the same input. Uh, and what happens in those cases is that you run into trouble. This is a lot more prominent in situations where you want to do things like uh, you know, music separation, where you can have multiple music sounds. Um, and again, the order could be permuted in all sorts of ways. Um, it, it's not easy to do something like that. Um, so in order to deal with this, uh, there's something called uh, a PIT, permutation invariant training. Um, and what that does is, it, uh, is a way of creating a sort of a, a meta loss function um, uh, that we can use. So we're going to use the same loss function that we had in the previous slide, but we're going to add one extra element to help us help us deal with that ambiguity. <clears throat> and the basic idea behind it is actually quite simple. So what we're going to do is let's say we have this case where we're separating speech from speech, and we have uh, you know S1 and S2 coming in, but then later on we might have S2 plus S1. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the loss of either of the permutation of sources. So our input is going to be S1 plus S2. And then we're going to try to figure out uh, how to separate S1, but also try to separate S2 as well. And then we're going to look at those outputs and see which of the two gives us the best loss function or the best SDR or STOI or whatever it is you're evaluating. And let's say that in this particular case, it was S1. If that's the case, we're going to propagate gradients that, uh, that, 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 that do that. Um, and then likewise, we can also get S2 out of it uh, as well once we have S1. And then later on, when we get the, uh, that signal again, even if the order of the speakers is permuted, we still see that the network does better when we extract S1 first and then S2. So we can use, uh, we can sort of, again, say that, you know what, even though I'm looking for the first source, which in this case is going to be S2, stick to separating S1 because you already know how to do that. And then I'm just going to flip the order of the outputs. So what that means is that when you design your neural network, you're looking at all of the outputs that you're getting, figuring out which permutation gives you the best result, um, optimize based on that permutation, and then you can undo that so you can get the order that you want. And if you do that, it actually works really well. Um, and that can help you uh, uh, do a, a very good uh, uh, separation when you have multiple speakers at the same time. So the pros is that we encourage the network to do whatever it knows how to do best by not confusing it by asking it to do multiple things. Um, uh, the, one of the problems is that now, uh, especially in cases where you say, I want to have three speakers and separate all of the voices, you don't have a lot of control during inference time on what the order of the output is going to be. But that's fine because when you have three people speaking, there's no implicit order in that, uh, in them, right? You can train a network to specifically focus on specific, speak specific speakers, and then you don't have to worry about this kind of thing. But if you say that I have a bunch of uh, uh, sources and they're all the same type, and I want to get them separated, uh, that, that statement does not imply an order. Um, so, so that uh, random permutation is going to be there anyway. Um, Finally, last thing to mention about evaluation, uh, there's a lot of data sets that, uh, that you can use to, uh, to train your systems and also to evaluate them. Uh, you need to have a lot of data to train those systems. Um, um, so whenever you try to evaluate any of those algorithms, yes, you have to report some kind of a loss function, but you also have to use some kind of a standard data set uh, if you want people to, uh, to be able to compare what you do with, with other papers. Uh, so there's a lot of options uh, for speech. Uh, people have been using a, a mixture data sets based on Wall Street Journal and LibreSpeech. Uh, uh, Wall Street Journal, of course, you have to pay to get the data, but LibreSpeech is free. So there's a bunch of data sets uh, uh, that are applied on those. Some of them also add uh, some reverberation on it to make things more challenging. Uh, so that's for speech and speech uh, separation. Uh, for music, again, there's a whole bunch of data sets that have uh, mixtures of uh, musical instruments, and then you also get 
uh, the separated tracks. Again, these are all standardized. You can easily Google and find them. Um, uh, so most papers uh, uh, are sort of linked to them anyway. Um, uh, and again, these are very good for, for evaluating and some of them for training as well. So to, uh, to close uh, the section, um, <clears throat> it's important to know what you're optimizing for. Um, uh, what sounds good is not necessarily gonna work well on your application. And then if you have end-to-end uh, -end networks, uh, you can get this uh, and differentiable losses. You can basically optimize the whole process and you can do very complex things like say, well, here's my input waveform, here's my output waveform, you know, optimize this, you know, very standard uh, industry uh, uh, metric, like, I don't know, PESC or something. Um, and actually it's, it's very easy to do it, uh, uh, doing things like that. All right, so I think it's time to take a little break right now. But before that though, do we have any questions on, on this section? All right, so um, I have a question. Yep. Oh, yeah, yes. So the question is uh, for speaker recognition task in noisy environments, which kind of VSS eval will be more important to improve, like SAR, SIR, or SDR? Um, so don't think of them as being competing. Um, SDR is kind of like a combination of SAR and SIR, so you can usually use that and it almost works just as well. Um, so if you care about uh, identifying speakers, um, I'm going to conjecture that what matters the most is that you have the least amount of artifacts. Um, so I would say optimizing uh, uh, SAR is probably one of the most important things, but you also need to, re uh, 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 to reduce noise as well. So I haven't done it. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm sort of theorizing here. Uh, but I would say uh, uh, a healthy dose of SAR to make sure that you don't alter the voice of the speaker is important. Uh, and then you also need to have some component of SIR because you want to suppress uh, any competing speakers to be able to do that. Um, but, but again, I haven't tried it. So again, just, uh, just my theory at the moment. But I wouldn't focus about on individuality and things like that, of course. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just uh, one more question. Uh, like in a multi-channel setting, uh, how should I handle a real-time non-stationary noise? Because I'm trying to work on it and it's really hard. I, I tried with masking approach. Uh -huh. uh, it's working well with stationary, but not like the real-time non-stationary noise. Okay, we'll be getting to multi-microphone stuff and some non-stationarity in a minute. So maybe you can re-ask that question on the next uh, part. Okay, thank you. Now we're gonna move on to um, what's a very typical thing when it comes to doing, um, uh, to working with neural networks, which is trying to find an architecture that actually works best. Um, so this is probably uh, where most of the action happen, is happening right now. We, we already have a good sense of what architectures work well, We uh, what sort of, setups work well with the cost function and all that. Um, but now there's been a series of papers in the last three, four years where people are trying to figure out what would be the best architecture uh, that can learn most efficiently with the data and sort of give us the best possible performance. Um, so we're gonna start from a one uh, a sort of observation um, that we need to have a model that's a bit more elaborate than what we started with. So remember what we had so far uh, was a very simple model. It didn't really look at any temporal uh, uh, correlations. So now we're going to use more modern uh, sort of uh, uh, building uh, elements of neural networks to uh, to get something better. <clears throat> so the uh, general structure that uh, um, um, that's used today looks as this. Uh, it's very similar to what we had before. You're going to have the input. There's going to be some kind of a convolutional layer that's the equivalent of a short-term Fourier transform or some kind of a, a basis decomposition that brings us to some latent space. Um, then what we had so far is a series of, of linear layers. We're going to call that those the separation modules. Um, and then whatever comes out from that sequence of, uh, of, of layers <clears throat> um, gets multiplied with the original representation. That gets put to our transpose convolution. That ends up being our um, uh, sort of resynthesis step. And then we get a waveform as an output. Um, so most of the innovation you're going to see is going to happen on the separation modules. And the question here is how do we get more performance out of them? 
Um, how do we structure them to be uh, uh, more efficient and, and, and sort of how do we get the best gradient flows to, to facilitate training? So the first thing to note, of course, is that, uh, you know, linear layers are okay, but that's what people did back in the 90s. So what we want to do is incorporate a little bit of time. Uh, so we're going to take our model, which so far was time agnostic, um, and it didn't really look anything uh, uh, around it, and now we're going to build some time uh, uh, sense to it. So what I mean by time agnostic is that you would get one frequency frame coming in uh, 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 as an input, so that would be just one function that would have been your C of T for a specific T, um, and then what would come out would be the equivalent uh, uh, Y of T. Um, but the order that the data would come in, it really wouldn't matter. Um, we didn't look at neighboring uh, context. We didn't look at anything like that. So now what we want to do is to fix the problem and, and, and put in structures in here that actually take a look at what's happening around you. Um, uh, and that's, of course, because we all know that speech does not, is not a sort of, a, 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 sort of a, a signal that's independent across all the time frames. There's a lot of context that, uh, that we need to take into account. So the usual tools to do that would be to effectively replace those linear layers by something like a convolutional network or a recurrent network or even some kind of an attention layer. And that will give us the ability to look at what's going on uh, around us. So let's start by using CNNs because that's the most obvious and probably the most powerful uh, way to do this. Um, so now we're going to refine, redefine the separation modules uh, as follows. We're going to have a sequence of convolutional uh, layers, whereas before we had simple uh, dense layers. Um, and what those layers will do is that they will take into account um, uh, some of the future and some of the past uh, uh, frames on a signal to come up with a better estimate. Um, if our convolutions had a, a filter size of one, um, then they would only look at the, specific, at the uh, current time point. But what we want to do is grow them in time so they can see a lot of the content, uh, context. Um, so the length of those filters is going to effectively define what we call the receptive field size. Um, and the receptive field size is basically a fancy way of saying of how big of a time window is my network uh, or, or my layer looking at. Uh, before, we had a receptive field size of just one frame. Um, now, because we're going to be doing convolutions, that's going to be a bigger uh, receptive field. So if somebody were to give you a, 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 a bunch of convolutional layers, um, and uh, each of them had a filter that had k taps, uh, um, a filter of, of k coefficients long, then you can use this expression to effectively figure out how big your overall receptive field would be after uh, uh, n modules. Um, now, the thing to remember is that these convolutions happen in terms of the front end frames. Uh, front end frames are going to be spaced from anywhere from one millisecond to 20 or maybe sometimes 40 milliseconds. Um, and so the convolutions we're doing are in that time scale. They're not uh, uh, on, a, on a sample level. So <clears throat> now one of the problems with CNNs is that it's going to be very hard to get very long receptive fields. Uh, for a lot of speech applications, you're going to need about a quarter to one second of context. Um, so that means that using the formula in the previous slide, you would probably need to have something like 300 layers of convolutions to get that. And that's a lot of convolutions. That's a very complicated network. That's not something that you really want to train on. Um, so we get a whole bunch of problems for doing that. Uh, well, first of all, is that the number of parameters is going to be uh, uh, very significant because every uh, CNN we have there is going to be probably in the order of a million parameters. Um, but we also start seeing vanishing gradient problems. If you have a lot of uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, convolutional networks one after the other, eventually the gradient um, uh, get, gets to diminish because uh, it is very hard to propagate all that information from so many transformations. So that's a well-known problem in, in, in neural networks. So we can use standard ways of, of dealing with it. Um, so to deal with vanishing gradients, we're going to use uh, uh, two tricks. We're going to use skip connections and we're going to use normalization. These are textbook approaches to, uh, uh, to dealing with, uh, with this problem. So, uh, you know, there's nothing uh, very specific to this problem here. So, um, <clears throat> so the skip connections are going to help us propagate gradients. And what we do with those cases is that right before you enter a, a, a convolutional layer, what you do is you take that signal and you sort of uh, 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 skip this processing that happens of the layer and the saturation, saturation that you have and effectively add the output of that section with its input. Now, what that does is that it makes sure that 
even if you can't propagate the gradient through the convolutions because information might be lost or whatever, you still have this path and that ends up helping a lot. Uh, the second trick we want to use is normalization. And that, what that's going to do is going to help you avoid a lot of extreme saturations. So uh, the way that you do it is that every time you have a convolution, either right before it or right after it, what you can do is uh, uh, what we call normalize the data, which means you want to shift it to have zero mean and optionally scale it so that it has unit variance. There's multiple ways of doing that. You can do that over the batches or over all, all the time samples or with different groups. So there's lots of different norms in, uh, uh, in neural nets. Um, most of them work just fine. So you know, there's not a huge difference between them. Uh, but the effect of doing this is that you condition the data so that the next convolution doesn't lose a lot of information because you might have like a, a shift that keeps going or a saturation that keeps becoming more extreme. Um, so adding the normalization layers actually helps a lot. Um, there's still active debate on whether you want to normalize before the convolution, after the convolution, or after the saturation. Uh, the, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, you can get uh, sort of my, slightly different results every time, but I don't think it's worth uh, uh, getting into that debate. Um, so, so these two tricks by themselves can help can help deal with the vanishing uh, gradients, but we also have to worry about the fact that we have a, a huge amount of layers and how how we can uh, we want to be able to reduce that. And of course, the standard way to do that um, is to use dilated convolutions that will allow us to get much larger receptive fields uh, from a, a, a much fewer layers. Um, so uh, the goal here is to not have 300 convolutional layers to get something like a second of, or half a second of, of context. We want to have a much, much smaller amount. And the way we're going to do that is as follows. We're going to be using uh, stacks of convolutional layers um, and then we're going to use dilation in, uh, in each successive stack. Now, with dilated convolutions, you probably already see them in the previous uh, lectures, uh, but the basic idea is that you take your input and then you apply the convolution on every D samples where these are your dilation factors. So, for example, on the top case here, we have a filter we apply on the input, so we're going to take neighboring points, multiply them with those coefficients, and that's going to be the output of the filter. If we have a dilation of two, we're going to take every two points from the input and apply the filter on these two points. So we're going to be skipping one. A dilation of four, we take every four samples, and so on and so forth. And what that allows us to do is to have a filter that spans a bigger uh, uh, amount of time while still only having a small number of coefficients. So that allows us to use fewer CNNs because we can quickly have CNNs that have a much, much bigger context window um, without having to wait until all the convolutions expand all the way to give us the big receptive field. So what we're going to do is we're going to stack the layered convolutions. And the standard way to do them uh, 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 in this field is that we're going to take um, uh, uh, sort of a sequence of CNNs. The first one is going to operate with a dilation of one, so just a regular filter. Second one, dilation of two, dilation of four, eight, 16, and so forth. So we're going over the powers of two uh, to basically quickly uh, expand the receptive field. Uh, in the graph here, I'm omitting, of course, all the activations and normalizations. Uh, uh, to make things a little simpler. So what's nice with this uh, setup is that we're getting an exponential growth on the size of the receptive field as we stack uh, more convolutional layers. So if you wanted to get a one second receptive field at eight kilohertz sampling rate, and I was using convolutions of three, uh, of three coefficients, I would need about 4,000 regular conv layers to get that much of a of a, of a receptive field, whereas if I use a, a stacked uh, dilated convolutions, I can, get a, I can get the same thing with only 12 of them. So that means that I can have many, many fewer parameters and still have a receptive field that, that sees a lot more. And that, of course, is a big win in, uh, um, uh, in sort of not having, uh, you know, humongous networks that will take a lot of resources to drain and would be prone to overfitting. Now, there's one more thing we're going to do to reduce the number of parameters even more, um, and that is to look at how we do the convolutions. Now, if you look at the regular uh, convolutional layer, um, let's say we have something that goes from n dimensions to n dimensions and has L uh, uh, filter coefficients, the amount of weights that you, get, that you have are going to be n by n by L. Um, and that can get pretty big, right? So, for example, in our cases, uh, we often have something like uh, 512 dimensions, uh, so that's going to be n, and our filters, let's say, filters, let's say, are going to be about three. Um, 
if you compute the value for that, that's going to be about 785,000 uh, uh, parameters. So that's a lot of parameters for something that doesn't do that much. So instead, what we can do is a trick where we factorize convolutions. And the basic idea is to take this single convolution here that has a lot of parameters and approximate it with the following scheme. We're going to take um, uh, uh, one convolution that goes from n dimensions to k dimensions, where k is going to be some sort of latent space. And that's going to be what we call a one, a one by one convolution. Effectively, what that means is that our filter size L is going to be one. And what this effectively does is it only does a linear transformation on the dimensions of our data. It's just like the same thing as applying a matrix transformation, a full matrix transformation on our n dimensions to go down to k dimensions. Um, so there's no convolution that happens in that case. All, the only operations happen across the dimensions. Then what we can do is uh, 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 apply a convolutional uh, a filter in this lower dimensional space. So now the values are gonna, we're going to have are going to be uh, k by k by l. And then use another uh, a one by one convolution to boost our dimensions from k dimensions to n dimensions and go up to the original dimensionality. So functionally, this done, does the same thing as the original. Um, the only difference is that now we're doing it by, uh, by going down to lower dimensions, separating the effect of mixing the dimensions and the effect of uh, filtering over time. Um, and that ends up giving us a, a, a sort of a, a, a set of layers that have fewer dimensions. They also have additional nonlinearity, which is a good thing, uh, but we can do roughly the same job with many, many fewer parameters. There's one more thing to add here in that when we get into the, uh, 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 the temporal convolution part in the middle, we're also using a depth-wise convolution, which means that instead of using uh, 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 a full set of filters for every output, in this case, K filter, in this case, K filters for every output, we can have one filter for every dimension. So that means we can go down to having K times L parameters as opposed to uh, uh, K squared times L parameters. Um, so if we do that, we can get an equivalent uh, sort of convolutional block that mixes both all of our latent dimensions, but also does some filtering over time uh, with much, much fewer parameters. If you do it right, you can go from something like uh, the 700,000 or almost 800,000 parameters that we have up here down to about 200,000 uh, uh, down here. Um, and this is used a lot because again, it simplifies things uh, by a huge amount. Um, so putting all of those ideas together uh, gave us one of the first architectures that worked really, really well, and that was uh, that's called the conf testnet. Um, so the basic idea is the same as before. There's a front end, uh, there's a resynthesis, nothing changed. We're still doing this masking uh, uh, operation, but now the layers that you have here are what we call the TCN modules. Um, and the way that those work is that you have, uh, for each of them, you get an input coming in, you have a sequence of convolutions, uh, that each have a different dilation that grows exponentially, you sum the outputs of all of those things uh, in the end, so you have all the, a bunch of skip connections in there, and then you, you get the output, and then that goes to the next uh, block, to the next block, to the next block, and additionally, you have skip connections between all of those blocks all the way to the uh, uh, output of the final block. So there's a lot of skip connections going on, um, uh, uh, but then there's a lot of simplified convolutions that we have in here. Um, and then if you look at the uh, convolution blocks that we have, that's where we start making use of those separable convolutions because the input is coming in. We go down to a lower dimensionality using a one by one convolutional network, just a linear transform. Um, we have our activations and our uh, uh, normalization. Now we do the temporal filtering uh, with a separable convolution down here. And then we boost it up again into n dimensions. There's a little bit of a, a, a difference here in that we have one path that computes the output by adding a skip connection, and then another convolution that gives us the skip connection that comes out from here and then gets added to the end. Uh, again, these are things that are not necessary to put in there. You could actually do the same thing without most of the skip connections and it would work okay. Uh, these are things that you know, uh, give us a little bit of extra performance. Um, it has an adaptive front end. It's going to be a, a little different from the uh, 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 what we have in terms of size. Usually, you use uh, uh, just about uh, you know 40 samples or 20 samples of, of basis length, so it's much shorter than the STFT that tends to be in the uh, you know hundreds or thousands of samples. Um, the hop size usually ends up being uh, you know 10 or 20 samples or so. Uh, but then if you look at the bases that, that, that are learned, you can see that it kind of looks like sinusoids, right? Here we have lo lots of low-frequency sinusoids. We can see that how the frequency keeps going up, and then all the way up here we have very fast-changing bases. 
which correspond to high frequencies. They're not exactly going to be sinusoids. They're going to be whatever basis is optimal for this particular problem uh, that we're trying to solve now. Um, uh, the TCN modules are usually about 512 dimensions, and then in the middle we go down to 128 dimensions for the separable convolutions. Filters are always uh, uh, three points, um, and we use stacks of four to eight uh, dilated convolutions. And you know most of the uh, sort of uh, uh, good versions of that model have about a one and a half second receptive field. So it's a pretty big receptive field. <clears throat> Um, but uh, it ends up having a, a relatively small size. It's about 5 million parameters. And if you do that, you get about 15 decibels SNR when you have people speaking at the same time. So that's speaker-speaker separation, So which is pretty good. Um, another thing we can do is to add recurrent layers. Um, and now, uh, instead of using convolutions to have a receptive field, uh, we can use a, a recurrence uh, uh, to help us see what, what's, what's going on around our network. Um, so most often uh, you're going to see uh, either LSTMs or BLSTMs used for that, but of course other RNN variants are fine as well. And the two sort of best known architectures that, uh, that do that are the, uh, the MOOC system and the DPRNN. Um, those systems do tend to be slower and or bigger, um, <clears throat> uh, but they actually can perform better, slightly better uh, than ConfTASnet uh, uh, just because LSTMs, uh, you know, can pay a little bit more attention uh, than convolutions. Um, so here's the uh, basic. Ari, yeah. I yes. think there is a raised hand. Is there any question, Felipe, or you forgot the uh, hand? Raised? Not was before, like the, in the previous block, I made that question. Ah, then you okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so which slide? Um, no, no, I already did the, the question. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay then, uh, then uh, put, I think if you click and again, raise hand, I think it will lower the hand. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can only see a subset of the, um, of the yeah. people on my window. So if somebody raises hand, I usually don't see it. So again, feel free to just jump in and speak. <clears throat> All right, so the, uh, the MOOCs architecture, um, it was originally designed for separating uh, musical instruments uh, from music mixes, so uh, it's got a sort of a slightly different scope, but you can also use it for uh, for speech enhancement as well. Um, the architecture is a little different from what we've seen so far, <clears throat> in that it's got what we, what they call a unit uh, 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 like architecture. So the basic idea is that you have an input coming in, <clears throat> and then you have a sequence of encoders, uh, and those encoders have skip connections to the corresponding decoders on the other side. What those do is they basically reshape your data to have always fewer and fewer uh, samples coming in because they're doing some kind of a resampling or striding. At the end, you end up with a representation that goes through a, a, a BLSTM that scans the network uh, uh, using both uh, sort of time direction, so you get a, a, a context on both, whoops, a context on both sides. And then that gets fed into decoders, which then use the skip connections from the encoders as well. And all of those things come together uh, to produce an output. The structure of the encoder uh, is going to have two convolutions. Uh, what happens, your data comes in, you project to some other dimensionality. There's a stride of, of four, so you're sort of decimating your, your, your samples as they come in. And then you split it into output and a skip connection. The decoders, they get their input, and their input also from a skip connection from the corresponding encoder that has the same size. Um, so those get added together. Um, oh, sorry, they, they get fed to each other. And again, they sort of undo the, uh, 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 the convolutions that were done in the encoding stage. And all of those things together uh, basically start from, a, from an audio input. These encoders kind of incorporate a lot of the front end and the separation as well. Uh, you get a lot of the uh, um, uh, sort of temporal magic happening in the BLSTM, but also in the convolutions. And then you can do all of that processing to reconstruct the waveform. Um, it's a very, uh, a very large network. Um, it could be slow because it's, it's got a lot of parameters, but the mean opinion scores on it are, are better than the uh, CompTASNet. Another, yet, yet another version is the DPRNN. Um, so uh, the only difference for, that it has from, uh, from CompTASNet is that it's using RNNs instead of convolutions. And it's building up on the idea of factorizing those convolutions in that with ConfTASnet, what we did is we factorized convolutions by saying there's going to be a convolution that doesn't have any time window. It's only operating across all of our dimensions. And then we're going to go to a separate convolution 
uh, separable convolution in a sort of uh, depth-wise convolution that only operates uh, on the time uh, index but doesn't really matter uh, bother with mixing our dimensions and then we mix them again after that with a one by one convolution that way we factorize things uh, dprnn does the same thing but it does it with rnns so effectively at every block you have one rnn that uh, scans over your dimensions uh, and does all the appropriate mixing that needs to happen there and that's followed by another RNN that uh, operates over time um, and that deals with the temporal aspects and then uh, these two together effectively cover both dimensions the uh, latent uh, uh, dimension uh, uh, aspect and then also the time aspect um, what's nice with that is that it ends up being a, a smaller network because you're using the uh, uh, RNNs that tend to be fairly compact um, and, and, and that for uh, things speech and speech you can get up to nine, 19 decibels of SDR which is a pretty amazing number but it's really really slow because RNNs are not going to be as efficient as convolutions um, so just to give you a taste of, uh, of, of what those things sound like uh, here's a couple of examples um, uh, these are all going to be denoising examples. So here's an input that's going to be the um, uh, the top left uh, uh, plot. Comma, a couple of years ago, comma, an impossible situation. And here's the separation out of it. Comma, a couple of years ago, comma, an impossible situation. Uh, here's another input. <laughs> Rears on July 31st to stock of record July 2nd. Um, so that's a pretty bad mixture. And here's what comes as an output. <clears throat> Rears on July 31st to stock of record July 2nd. Um, another input. Um, they have no basis to believe it was unconstitutional, period. Um, we have no basis to believe it was unconstitutional, period. And one last one. Oops. $19 a share for the 2.6 million United Presidential... $19 a share for the 2.6 million United President. So as you can hear, they do pretty well. <clears throat> In removing a lot of the noise, um, they are creating some artifacts because the overlap at the, that they're doing is not as uh, uh, sophisticated as the uh, uh, inverse short Fourier transform. We have the tapering windows and everything is kind of smooth. So you get a little bit of roughness there. Uh, but for the most part, they actually sound pretty good uh, uh, for, for, for a lot of cases. And you know, again, if you Google online, you're going to find things that sound even better than that. Uh, so there's a lot of activity happening in, the, uh, in that space. <clears throat> um, Quick note that you can also have multi-channel versions of those systems. Um, it's very easy to take all of the models that I've shown before um, and extend them to deal with multi-channel inputs. Uh, the only difference is that your front end now will have to combine multiple channels coming in and then getting some joint uh, 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 sort of a signal coming out of it. Um, what I'm going to show now is a modification that's uh, more appropriate for things like swarms of microphones or when you have microphones where their respective position changes all the time or their number of microphones keep changing over all the time. <clears throat> so that could be a situation where you have a bunch of laptops uh, in, in a meeting room and then people come and go and new microphones come and go as well with them. Or you can have uh, all of the cell phones in a concert where there's people recording at random times uh, on and off. <clears throat> Uh, so these are things which are kind of like an array, but not quite. Um, so again, we can still use those models in that situation, but it requires a slightly different approach. So here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> the idea is that the number of channels that you're getting in is not going to be fixed. Um, and whenever you're dealing with uh, uh, uncertainty in, in, in any number with a neural network, your best bet is to use something like a re recurrent network. So uh, the current models that we talked about would get uh, sort of a, a noisy input and let's say it's going to be a, a n number of channels um, and you can fix your front end to take n channels get some transformation and then give you <clears throat> let's say a single channel that has the uh, the output that you want um, but if i were to change the number of channels uh, dynamically i wouldn't be able to deal with this i would have to train a new network to deal with a new number of channels or if i move my microphones it would have to adjust its front end so so uh, that kind of a model can, cannot facilitate a lot of dynamic setups. Um, uh, so, uh, so whenever, uh, so, 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 so it cannot generalize. So what we're going to do <clears throat> is uh, uh, do uh, use what we call a multi-view network. And the idea here is that you're doing sequential processing of the input channels. 
So instead of taking all of the channels at the same time, processing them as a single block, and then doing the further processing, what we're going to do is we're going to take the channels as a sequence of, of, of events, and we can use an RNN to process them. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the first channel, we're going to put it through our one channel denoiser, it's going to give us some kind of an output, it's not going to be optimal because it's only going to take one of the channels, but then we're going to, whoops, then we're going to feed that output back uh, uh, to that uh, uh, network as we give it as an input the second channel. And now it's going to give us a refined output that's going to combine the previous output and the new input. And then we're going to do that over and over and over, and we're going to scan over all the channels. Now, the advantage of doing that <clears throat> is that we only need one channel at a time. So if at any point in time I know I have five channels available, I'm just going to run this thing five times. If on the next time step uh, a sixth uh, channel appears, then I can run it on six channels. Um, and they're all using the same uh, sort of computational core here, and the only thing that changes is how many times you run this thing because uh, you have a different number of inputs. Um, so it's effectively a, a recurrent neural network that operates over all of the channels. Um, so the way that the overall system would look like um, is that you would get an input frame coming in. That could be a, a Euro signals or it could be your Fourier slices. Doesn't matter what it is. <clears throat> um, each channel gets fed, fed to that network the output of that network gets fed to itself again as it sees the next channel and so on and so forth. And then once we're done with all the channels, we take that output and say, this is what came out at that frame. And then we take that and feed it on to the next uh, uh, time frame, uh, so we can do an RNN expanded over time as well. Um, and then we go through the same process again and again and again. And what's nice again is that every frame we can have a different number of channels and things work out really nice. <clears throat> Um, uh, just to show a couple of uh, uh, interesting plots that, that tell us why this is a good idea. Um, so this is the SDR uh, depending on number of channels. This is a system that was trained on five channels and then we see how it performs. And we see that if you give it fewer channels, obviously it doesn't do as well. Uh, uh, the blue line is the baseline for the five channels. But then as you give it more and more channels, you can see that the performance is slowly becoming higher. So it's learning to generalize. The other thing that's uh, kind of nice is that the uh, um, uh, the channel order doesn't matter too much. Uh, here we have two experiments, one of them where we uh, give to that multi-view network uh, uh, channels that have decreasing SNR as time goes by. This is the blue line. And you see as time goes by, the results don't get biased too much about from the worst inputs coming in. So it's actually uh, maintaining a decent output. Likewise, if you give it uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, channels in order of worst to best, you can see that it learns how to improve the performance. So at the end, you get very similar performance in both cases, um, even though the order of the channels was completely different. Um, so again, what that tells us is that uh, the system has learned to be channel uh, uh, order invariant as well. So uh, to uh, sort of close the architecture section, um, getting some temporal awareness was very important. We could do that with convolutional or, or recurrent layers. Um, there's also some papers that came out recently that using attention to replace uh, the RNNs, so that's an option as well. Um, we can also have some awareness on the number of channels by using the multi-view networks. Um, and the whole idea is that we want to be smart with, uh, with all these architectures to try to avoid as much bloat as we can. We want to have those networks to be small, we don't want them to be humongous. Um, and the only thing we do with convolutions and recurrent uh, models is we basically reuse a lot of the parameters in a way to, uh, uh, to sort of simplify things. Um, there's a ton of variations. Start Googling those things. Uh, if you want, you can find source code for most of those things on GitHub um, and you can start playing with them uh, uh, immediately. So um, any questions on the architectures before we move on? I, I don't have a direct question on architecture, but it's related to the multi channel and our actual mass. So should I ask now or I can ask later? Yep, go for it. Okay, so the question is, uh, so I have the noise recorded in like a real life industry noises, uh, which have a non-stationary noises. So the issue is when I do the Oracle binary mask, uh, like when I quote my results on Oracle binary mask, it performs bad compared to the noisy speech in terms of SAR, SIR, and SDR. So when I train my DNN to predict the mask, obviously it will never work because Oracle is not working. So, so that's my question like, what direction I should take forward. So so in this case, your Oracle is on the short-time Fourier transform space, right? Yes. Okay, so 
the um, the beautiful thing with the um, uh, 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 Comptastant paper, um, in fact, it was part of the title of the paper, is that the performance that we're getting was actually, uh, so <clears throat> if you use the same networks with a short time Fourier transform uh, front end, they are going to saturate at about 11 dB SDR or so. I, that, that's kind of the limit of the performance. Uh, and, and an Oracle binary mask would maybe get you a couple more, but, but this is where the limit is. Uh, what they've shown in that paper is that by using an adaptive front end, you can get, you know, seven or eight dB more in performance uh, from the Oracle uh, case, uh, just because you're using a different representation. So, <clears throat> so I would say that the representation that you're using, uh, uh, you know, the latent space you're in, which is that short time Fourier transform space, is probably not the optimal space. And the Oracle mask that you have is not necessarily going to give you what the real upper bound is. It's going to give you the upper bound of using that representation. But there's probably other representations that a network should be able to learn that will get you a, a, a much better performance. There are also other issues, of course, right? You need to have enough parameters, enough dimensionalities, enough uh, recept uh, you know, big enough receptive fields. So there's a million things that could go wrong, which is one of the unfortunate things with neural nets. Um, but I would say don't look at the Oracle results from a, a binary mask on an SDFT as, as any guidance at this point. You should be able to do much better than that by an adaptive okay. front end. Okay. Just, to, just to add one more point here. I also tried with the Wiener mask and, and ratio mask and yeah, but it was the same. So thank you yeah. for the feedback. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, definitely look at, um, at a different time, uh, type of front ends. <clears throat> there is a, um, actually there was a student of mine had a paper called a two-step uh, source separation, I think. Um, <clears throat> and the basic idea there was to try to find um, uh, the best possible uh, 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 space to do the separation. So there's one step where you're effectively doing Oracle uh, 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 binary masking, but you're doing it on a, on a, uh, on a space that you're learning the best space for it. Um, and that ends up getting you the best possible space for the task or for your training data. And then you can get that, you can fix that and use it with a network like CompTASNet. Um, that would be the equivalent, the only equivalent I would think to what you're doing in that you will be um, uh, simultaneously optimizing the best space and seeing what's the, what's the optimal, what the uh, optimal binary mass can get you. And in those cases, you're getting, you can get numbers up to like 40, uh, you know, mid 40s uh, dB in, in SDR, which is really pushing the numerical uh, precision of, of those systems. Um, so if you were to implement something like this, and if you, know, if you send me a message on Slack, I can point you to the paper, uh, you would see what the true upper bound is given a neural network uh, uh, framework. Okay, um, thank you. All right, so, <clears throat> Uh, now, a few words about efficiency and deploying those things and, and all that stuff. Um, again, it shouldn't be surprising at this point. These things are huge. There's a, a lot of convolutions, a lot of matrices, a lot of parameters. Uh, the, uh, I find the Demux uh, model to be kind of amusing because it's uh, more than 400 uh, uh, million parameters, which is you know, a remarkable amount of, of stuff to pack into a model, um, which means uh, that a lot of those networks are not particularly practical, right? So. Um, especially if you work in the industry and you, you know, care about deploying those things in real life, um, uh, a lot of those models that I've shown so far are not really going to cut it. Um, so we want to see what are the things that we need to worry about to, uh, to do that. Um, first thing you need to worry about is causality, and that's a big deal. Um, if you wanted to have this thing running on, say, a cell phone or, a, you know, some kind of a smart speaker device, um, you need to have a causal system. Um, so, uh, and, and what I'm doing in the plots in the bottom here, what I've done is I've plotted the equivalent of an impulse response of some of those networks. Um, so what you see on the left is the impulse response of a conf task net. What I've done is I just put it, gave it an impulse function, just a delta function. Uh, and then I saw what came out. So this is the signal that comes out when you have, uh, give it uh, 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 just a delta function and then all of, the, all of the weights are set to one. And what you're seeing here is basically the extent of the receptive field, right? There's a lot more stuff that's happening in the middle because a lot more filters operate there. Um, but the entire process spans from minus 1.2 seconds to plus 1.2 seconds. So you get almost a, a two and a half seconds worth of, um, of a receptive field. Uh, but 
that, uh, that model looks at future values and it also looks at past values. And because we're doing this operation offline, that's perfectly fine, right? We're just centering our convolutions. So if somebody gives us a sound, we can look in the future, we can look, look in the past and that's perfectly fine. Likewise with the uh, 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 recurrent models, because we, uh, uh, most of them use a, a, a BLSTMs that scan the sequence forward and then backwards as well. And again, that would be a case where we're sort of cheating because we're looking at the future. In real life, you won't be able to look at the future. So you have to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, change things accordingly. So there's a couple of things you can do. Um, the BLSTM models are not gonna work in those cases. You would have to uh, move to an LSTM model where you don't do the backward scanning. And if you do that, that's okay. But of course, it, it, uh, uh, it, it, it ruins performance a bit. With convolutions, it's a bit more uh, uh, interesting. Um, here's the impulse response, the equivalent impulse response of a conf net, but this time I'm only using causal filters. So instead of having uh, three tap filters where the center tap corresponds at time zero, and then you have one looking in the future and one looking in the past, now I'm shifting this. So I'm looking at two time steps in the past and, and the current time step. So that makes it a causal filter. And if I do that, um, it, it looks like this. So it's got roughly the same, uh, <clears throat> extend as well, um, but now you see that it, you don't have to look in the future, you're only looking at the past. If you do that, of course, performance is gonna drop by you know three or four decibels in SDR, uh, but that's of course the price of not being able to look ahead. A compromise would be to use asymmetric filters, which is what I'm doing here. So again, in the regular comp task net, what we have is three, filter, is three, uh, uh, three tap filters, you have one in the center and then symmetrically one looking in the future, one looking in the past. As you use dilations, those two, those spread apart and they can sort of come further apart while still looking at the center or come closer. Now what we do is we take the current time, the next future frame, and then we only dilate the past. So what that helps us do is that we're getting a wide receptive field going towards the past and we're getting a very short expansion of the receptive field looking in the future. So now we're looking 40 milliseconds in the future, which is an acceptable delay, um, and 1200 milliseconds to the past. Um, so again, that helps us look a little bit further out ahead and that can help us get uh, uh, better results uh, 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 due to that. Um, we also have to worry about things like real-time potential. Uh, processing one second of sound should happen faster than one second. So a lot of those algorithms have a lot of demands uh, computationally. Uh, a lot of them can only run on a GPU in a reasonable manner. Um, or some of them are very easy to pipeline uh, well. For example, the LSTMs, because of the recurrent computations, are very difficult to, uh, to, to sort of optimize them uh, computationally. Um, so being able to minimize the processing time is something that's very, very important. Um, most of the papers you're gonna see, of course, are not focusing on things like that. Um, and also a lot of the deep learning toolboxes are not suited for, for doing uh, any kind of sort of streaming inference on sequential data. So for example, you can't do convolutions where you keep a buffer uh, uh, sort of filled. Um, so, so again, this is something you have to worry about as well. <clears throat> um, and finally, memory requirements is a big thing. Um, you have two types of memory consumption. One of it is the number of parameters in your model itself. So for example, the MOOCs has a huge uh, uh, parameter space, more than 400 million parameters, but you also have to worry about intermediate representations. Every time you take a signal and you put it through a, a convolutional layer, what comes out of it is many filtered versions of that signal. So if your signal took a certain amount of space, once it comes out from the convolution, it's still gonna occupy some space in your, on your GPU or, or your CPU, depending on when you run things. And it turns out that once you have a lot of convolutional layers, that introduces a lot of intermediate representations or intermediate variables that take a lot of memory. So most of the memory consumption that happens with those models is not gonna be the model and the input or and the output, it's gonna be the stuff that happens inside. Um, and it's not easy to, uh, a lot of times to optimize for them. Um, so, so that's a big problem uh, in training and inference as well. Um, so one model that was proposed to alleviate those things is the uh, whimsically named the pseudo RMRF model. Um, so what this model does is it's basically trying to find the trade-off between separation performance, but also computational uh, uh, constraints. Um, and it's got a couple of key elements in it. One of it is that it's using a lot of resampling operations to minimize memory use. So instead of using, for example, dilated convolutions, what you can do is resample the input and use the same convolution as before. And that helps you not waste as much uh, uh, memory. Uh, it's using a lot of faster operations to, uh, to replace 
previous operations with uh, much simpler uh, uh, processes, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, and it's using a form that is amenable to have making a large model if you need to, but also uh, compressing it to a much smaller size. Uh, so it's more of a family of models than a specific thing. <clears throat> Um, and the other thing that it's uh, uh, designed to do is to try to learn from data as fast as possible. So the basic architecture look, look like, looks like this. Again, it's going to have the same framework as before. We have the front end. We have the resynthesis. We're still doing some kind of a, 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 a of masking taking place here. Uh, but now we have this UConv uh, separation models. And the way that they look is that for each of those layers, you're going to get the input coming in. <clears throat> and then you're going to uh, convolve that with uh, with some kind of a set of filters and decimate by a factor of two or use a stride of two. So that's going to give you half the size in, in, uh, in time samples. Um, and then you're going to get to the second level. And then you're going to do that again. You go to the third level, fourth level, fifth level. You do this for as many levels as you want. And with every level, you're getting a smaller and smaller output coming out. And that means that you're saving a lot of the uh, 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 a lot of memory by doing this. If instead of doing a, a uh, this striding, I was doing, say, dilated convolutions to make up for it, all of those intermediate outputs would be the same size, and I would get much more memory usage. Um, and then once we get to the very bottom, uh, the last uh, layer, the, uh, level that we want, we invert that process. <clears throat> and the only thing that we do is we just use a simple upsampling operation, um, <clears throat> just using nearest neighbors. Um, and then at every level, we also have a skip connection where we sum what, what the uh, original encoder did. So we do that and we propagate all the way uh, up to the same size as we started with, and that comes out, and then we move into the next one. So by doing this kind of structure, we're saving a lot of memory, and then we're saving a lot of computation here because we're just doing simple, uh, 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 you know, replicating our data every other time step, as opposed to doing bigger convolutions that have to fill in the gaps. So what's nice with that model um, is that it, it it allows us to do things without uh, uh, with with a lot of savings uh, computationally. So this is a table that kind of shows you the models that we examined. Um, the uh, pseudo MRF model with one uh, X is kind of like the big model. This is a smaller version that's using a smaller number of those uh, 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 resampling steps uh, and modules. So uh, again, the results are for uh, speech versus speech. So it's the Wall Street Journal two speakers speaking at the same time, trying to separate them. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, um, you know, Comptasna is about 15, 16 decibels. Uh, the MOOC is a little lower. It actually works better for music. Uh, DPRNN. Um, uh, it gets uh, almost 19 decibels, which is really close to the state of the art. Right now, it's about 20, 21 decibels. Uh, but you can see that pseudo RMRF is, is kind of close to it. Um, the difference is that once we look at the number of parameters, we see that there are a lot of differences. For example, ConfTASN is about 5 million parameters. The MOOCs is more than 400, 400 million. DPRNN is smaller because it's using uh, the LSTMs, uh, but pseudo RMRF is uh, uh, 2.6 uh, parameters for the big model, or it can go down to under a million parameters for the smaller model. If you look at the number of gigaflops, uh, ConfTASN is reasonable. The MOOCs is actually a little more efficient in that sense. <clears throat> DPRNN, because it has a lot of LSTMs, it's actually extremely slow uh, to run. So it's, uh, you know, nowhere near real time. Um, um, so, uh, and again, if we compare what we get with the pseudo MRF, we're seeing that we're getting much, much uh, uh, a smaller number of gigaflops required per second of, of input. Um, and the performance, again, is comparable. Likewise, if you look at the memory, um, this is how much memory takes to process one second of, of audio at uh, eight kilohertz. Uh, we see that the pseudo MRF gives us the smallest numbers. And then if we look at the CPU processing time, again, it ends up being one of the most efficient ones. <clears throat> so if I were to make a, something like a real-time system that works on a phone, I would probably look at something like the, the small pseudo MRF model, uh, just because it doesn't require a lot of memory. It requires the smallest amount of, 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 of gigaflops uh, for audio coming in. If I wanted to get the super duper state-of-the-art uh, numbers, I would probably use something like DPRNN, which does give me great numbers. But at the same time, um, it ends up being 50 times slower, uh, well, oh, sorry, uh, 50, yeah, 50 times slower than the, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, than the other models. Um, likewise, I'm not going to show this here because we're going to run out of time. Uh, you can show that training can also become more efficient when you do those things, right? Because uh, you can do a lot more epochs of training uh, with, a, with a gigaflop uh, 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 with allocated gigaflops than you would do with, uh, with different models. <clears throat> 
Uh, one other thing we can do is we can also talk about hardware efficiency. Um, so even if we use the smaller models, we still have to worry about doing a lot of uh, uh, gigaflops of processing. So if you want to do this thing uh, on an embedded device, like a smart uh, hearing bud or a smart watch or uh, any of those things, um, uh, we need to do, find a way of getting things smaller. Um, and a good way to do that is to look at binary neural networks. And that's one way of, 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 of minimizing uh, the amount of actual processing you have to do in hardware. So we're gonna do a little detour and talk about that as well. So the idea is to uh, basically quantize as much as we can. A standard trick in, in neural networks nowadays is to take your input, uh, take your neural network rather, and uh, uh, quantize it down to 16-bit floating point or maybe 8-bit floating point. And that helps you save a lot of processing power and sometimes makes the math a little faster as well. Um, but still, that's a lot of uh, uh, complicated hardware uh, to do all the floating point uh, uh, or, or even fixed point uh, math. Uh, what we're going to do instead is what we call a binarization. So what we're going to do is we're going to take every input uh, and model parameter and, and uh, sort of uh, uh, represent them by a single bit. It's either going to be zero or one. So we're not going to get any uh, uh, real numbers. We're not going to get any integers. Everything is going to be a zero or a one. All of the ways of our network, all of our inputs, all of our outputs. <clears throat> so that what that means is that we don't have to use integer arithmetic, and that means that we can simplify uh, the amount of processing uh, happening on hardware uh, significantly. So how do we do that? So what we have here in this equation is a typical formulation of what a neural network unit looks like. Uh, we have x being the input, w being the model weights. Effectively, what happens is that your input comes in, you compute a dot product with your weights, you sum everything, and then that goes through a saturating function. Now, let's see what happens more carefully. Um, if my x's here are positive numbers, and their corresponding w's are positive numbers, the product is going to end up being uh, a, a positive number. If, if this happens a lot, the summation is going to become much bigger, and that means we're going to saturate the hyperbolic tangent towards plus one. Likewise, if the x's are negative numbers and the w's are negative numbers, I'm going to get the same effect. But if the signs between the x and the w's are different, what's going to happen is that I'm going to get a negative number from all those multiplications. If you sum a lot of them together, you're going to saturate the hyperbolic tangent towards negative values. So if you have a lot of agreement in the signs of your weights and your inputs, your output will tend to be plus 1. If not, your output will tend to be minus 1. Right, so that's at a rough level what's happening uh, in a typical neural network. Now, if we want to map this to binary, what we can say, well, let's assume that our uh, sort of uh, uh, negative numbers are minus ones, the positive numbers are plus ones. We can only use a binary representation, so we're going to map this to zeros and ones. So minus one becomes zero and plus one becomes one. I can take the operation that I had in the previous slide and reimagine it by using bit operations. And the equivalent would be the following. If I were to take the x nor of x and y and uh, w, that would be the equivalent of the multiplication table. So here what we're saying is that if the sign of, of x and w is the same, you're going to get a, a, a positive number coming out. If they're different, you're going to get a negative number. What the ex, uh, exclusive uh, nor does is that when you have the same bits, you get a 1. When you have different bits, you get a 0. So if my w's and my x's disagree in sign, this saturates to plus one or minus one. Here, if my bits uh, disagree on whether the zeros are ones, uh, this will likely give me, give me a lot of ones, a lot of zeros. Now, if I see that I get a lot of ones uh, on average, so I say, if say more than half the bits are set to one, then I'm going to say my output is going to be a one. If less than my bits are set at one, then half of my bits are set to one, then I'm going to output at zero. So effectively, what we're doing with those operations is a very crude quantized version of what's happening here. Now, what do we want to do that? Well, that means that I can take a real valued network, which would have floating point values. So we have, a, say, an input vector coming in. We have a matrix here that's going to have all the floating point values. We have to do all this multiply and accumulate. We have to compute all those nonlinearities, which, again, take some time. Um, and that's going to give me a real valued output. I could replace that with a binary valued network, where now, instead of doing multiply and accumulate, I'm doing an XNOR and a bit count, which are very fast operations to do in hardware. Everything is represented by a bit. If more than half my bits are set, uh, then I set them to zero. 
uh, then a, a to one or to zero accordingly, and then the output ends up being a binary output as well. So what we've done is we've done a very, very rough quantization of, 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 of the same operation, but now there is no need for, uh, uh, for any floating point uh, logic uh, on our hardware. Um, and our data takes only one bit per parameter as opposed to you know, 10 to 64, which would be the real value version. Um, if you want to train that, um, we're still going to train such model with real values. It's not easy to train with binary values and it's going to be fine. And the one trick we're going to do is so as we train the network, we're going to apply hyperbolic tangent on our weights. And what that does is it, saturates, it helps us saturate those weights. We're going to regularize it so we can say, make the weights be as big as possible in magnitude. So most of them will end up being either a plus one or a minus one after they go through the hyperbolic tangent. So by the end of training, we're gonna have a network where most of the parameters will be plus one or minus one. Once we have that, we map them to, uh, to, uh, to zero and one, and we get the binary form uh, that we can deploy. Um, likewise, the inputs have to be a, a binary value as well, uh, because we can't XNOR real data. We can do that in many ways. We can take our data and sort of quantize it, or we can use some kind of hash representation. There's different ways of doing that. Uh, but again, once we do that, we end up with a binary representation that we can feed to that network. <clears throat> so how well does that work? Uh, this is an example doing uh, just a MNIST a digit recognition, just as a simple benchmark. Um, what you see with the uh, uh, dark blue is what the real value the neural network does. Light blue is what the binary neural network does. All of those are different configurations and what you're seeing is the error rate. So you see that for equivalent sizes, our error rate is about, you know, one, one and a half, uh, 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 maybe two uh, uh, percent worse than the real valued network. But at the same time, the amount of computation or necessary hardware and the amount of storage in the binary network is vastly smaller than the real valued network. So it ends up being a win. Now, why we care about that, you can see in the hardware comparison, um, if we have one, uh, uh, one connection of a binary neural network uh, with the real value, the thing is that would be a real, uh, a 32 bit real multiplication, which is a fairly sophisticated hardware. It's gonna be a simple gate for binary network. And then as you move up into layers and networks, you can see that uh, uh, things become uh, uh, much, much simpler. So at the extreme case, um, uh, if we just wanted to do a comparison, so for example, uh, the hardware area required for having a 32-bit float uh, network of about that size is about uh, 6,000 uh, 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 micro uh, squared meters. If you use a binary network, it goes down to 100, so we're saving about an order of magnitude. Uh, and if you look at the power, we're saving about two orders of magnitude. So these are all the simulations because we have to design special hardware for that as well. So going back to audio, um, we can take an input spectrogram and we can represent all the pixels using, a, say, a four-bit uh, quantization. So now we're going to get a four a dimensional vector for every uh, time frequency bit. Um, and then we can train a binary network whose job is to find a binary mask to apply on that bit pattern itself. And we can train it. And if you do that, here's some examples that we're getting for, uh, for some uh, denoising. Uh, I think that was some stationary noise. <clears throat> Um, you can see that the, uh, again, the dark bars are the uh, real valued networks. Uh, the blue bars are the uh, uh, binary valued networks. For the SDR, SIR, SAR, we see that we're getting roughly the same amount of performance. We're about one or two dBs lower, uh, but we're still doing respectively well, um, even though we are uh, using a, a much, much, much smaller uh, networks. Um, so again, this follows to that. You can do things with uh, hybrid models. Uh, Minja Kim at Indiana has also figured out how to do that with uh, LSTMs and other models. Um, and you can even try talking about processing PDM audio streams directly. Uh, so PDMs are just binary audio streams. Uh, so again, uh, those things are nice if you care about hardware. If you're a software character, then this is completely useless because implementing binary networks that way is, 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 is not something that's efficient with, with the current uh, uh, software and hardware that we have. All right, so to recap on that, uh, on this part, if we care about deployment, uh, we have to worry about a whole bunch of different things. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't do as much processing, that we're sensitive about memory. Uh, at the algorithmic level, we have to make sure that, you know, we, we have some sense of causality. Um, there's a lot of uh, variations uh, to all of the stuff that I said. Um, you don't see a lot of those things published because they're usually systems that get deployed uh, uh, commercially. So uh, these are things you kind of have to discover on your own as you're, as you're doing those things. But again, these are the things you want to keep in mind. 
So any questions on, uh, <clears throat> on this part? Um, I have a question. Um, so you said that you train the system with uh, float points and then uh, in inference, you change it to binary. Yep. Uh, you cannot like do like a fine tuning with the binary network then so you can further improve the quality. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff hidden under the rug there, so I just, uh, you know, breeze through it. Um, uh, yes, uh, the proper way to train a binary value network <clears throat> is that you train it with real values, and then there's a step where you're fine-tuning it uh, because you're fixing the weights to, uh, uh, because you're, 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 you're explicitly using quantization in the process, and that forces the model uh, to, to compensate for some of the quantization that happens. Uh, so there's there's you know, four or five different papers that show different ways of doing that. Uh, but yes, there's usually a fine tuning step. If you don't do it, it's still gonna work. It's not gonna be as good. Okay, okay, thanks. Sure. All right, um, so I'm gonna pick up the speed a bit. So the next thing you wanna worry about is data considerations. Um, uh, neural nets uh, need a lot of careful collection uh, uh, when it comes to data. So we want to, uh, to deal with that as well. So what we're gonna do now is gonna talk about how do you build your training data set and what's a, a good way of making it not be extremely time consuming um, and, and, and sort of get around some of the problems there. So um, here's a typical training uh, uh, with, with a, 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 th that we're using so far. Um, what you do is you get a database that has a lot of speech recordings, you get a database that has a lot of noise recordings, if, if you want to do speech noising. And what you do is that you create artificial mixes between the speech and the noise, that's going to be your input. And then since you know what the original speech was, that can act as a target. Now, there's a couple of problems with this. First of all, we need to have an exact target for every input, right? Um, so we have to use synthetic inputs. And every time you create synthetic inputs, that means that you're introducing some kind of a bias. So right now, maybe I'm using uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal data set for my, uh, um, for my speech, and maybe I'm using the BBC sound effects for my, uh, 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 for, for my back ambient noise. Well, Wall Street Journal is mostly people speaking English, and then the BBC sound effects is constrained to certain types of noises. Um, if I wanna deploy that system with people that speak Mandarin, it's not gonna work as well because the speech examples it's seen are not gonna be representative of what happens in a different language that has all the tonal elements and all that. Likewise, whatever noises uh, the people from BBC thought were, 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 were adequate were not necessarily represent the noises you would find uh, in, in, in some street in Asia, right? So um, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to get around this idea of bias, of course, a very complicated uh, problem, uh, but it would be a, a good to find a way of not, of, of not having us deal with it and being able to learn from real data. <clears throat> So, so what we want to do is try to make our system perform some new tricks um, uh, and do it without seeing a, a, a sort of this one-to-one -one correspondence between inputs and outputs. And the way we're going to do it is by using sort of a very human-like approach. What we're going to do is we're going to learn from inputs and outputs that do not match. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to train the system in a way where we're going to give it a bunch of bad recordings. And this would be recordings that have noise or recordings that have reverb or things that we don't want. And also give it some completely different good recordings. And the idea is that we're gonna tell to our network that, well, look, there are some recordings which we consider to be bad and this is what they sound like. And here's what we consider to be a good recording. So now if I give you a, a bad recording, can you find a way of processing it and making it sound like a good recording? So we're not explicitly making mappings between inputs and outputs, we're giving it examples of what good and bad uh, sounds uh, are like. And that of course makes our data much, much easier because now I can go into the real world and collect real noisy samples where I don't have the ground truth. I can use those as being my targets. Um, um, and then I don't have to worry about having the ground truth train my system. At the same time, I can also collect a bunch of clean sounds and I can use that as my, as my inputs. So how do we do that? So the way to do that is by using a sort of a style transfer kind of approach. Um, so we're gonna have, uh, uh, basically uh, 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 something equivalent to what people do in, in computer vision. So in computer vision, what happens, we say that, you know what, there's an input that we have, let's say it's this picture of a spectrogram, 
and then here's the style I wanted to be in the, the, the great wave of uh, Kanagawa, which is you know, famous painting. Um, and what those style transfer uh, networks do is they basically take elements from here and try to re-render what the input looks like with those elements. So in this particular case, if I were to do it in computer vision, I would get a spectrogram that looks like this, right? So it's clearly using the same style. Um, at the same time, it has the elements that we find in the original input. So we want to do the same thing, but we want to do this thing in audio. We want to say, um, you know what, here's a noisy recording, uh, but here's another recording, completely different, that sounds really good because it doesn't have noise. Can you render my noisy recording in the style of the clean recording? So that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> so to do that, um, we're, we're going to have to design a sort of a, a, a style transfer network. Um, so we're going to use uh, the following logic. We're going to use uh, two sets of training data. We're going to need one set of training data that has a lot of clean speech and one set of data that has a lot of noisy speech. Um, again, we don't have to use the same speakers or the same uh, uh, sentences or, or the same recordings for the clean and the, and the noisy recordings. They can be completely disjoint data sets. The idea is that both of those things are going to be representative of what good speech or clean speech sounds like and what noisy speech sounds like. They're representative of those two styles. And then we're going to train an audio autoencoder for each style. And we're going to see how in a minute. Um, and then we're going to train those autoencoders, what we call cycle passes, that will uh, help us figure out how to translate from one style to the other. So let's look at it in a graphic form to make better sense of it. So the first step is we're going to make autoencoders for every style. Um, so I'm going to take all of my, say, let's say, clean audio speech recordings, and I'm going to train them through a system that has some kind of an encoder, um, a latent representation. So this can be uh, very similar to what we did before, right? It could be uh, something like a conf tasnet or a bunch of LSTMs or whatever you want to use. Uh, it doesn't make a huge difference, but that's going to give us some kind of a latent representation. And then we're going to have a step where we take that representation and then re-render it back as audio um, uh, 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 and get the original input, right? So this, what this network does is try to find a latent representation for the input such that it can reconstruct it uh, as an output. Uh, and of course, that has to be a lower dimensional. Likewise, we can do the same thing with the undesirable type of audio. For example, I could take noisy or reverberant, uh, reverberant speech and do the same thing. So now we have uh, uh, two encoders and two decoders, uh, each of them best suited for uh, you know, good desired type of audio, and then uh, one of them suited for the uh, type of bad audio that we have. <clears throat> Now, the second step is we have to train what we call cycle passes, and that will help us come up with the, uh, uh, what we want. So the way it's going to do, uh, it's going to happen, is we're going to take good audio, and we're going to translate that to what we call a sort of a bad audio, and then back to good audio again. And the way we're going to do that is by, by a path that looks like this. We're going to take clean speech, encode it, get the latent presentation. These things are already learned, right? Um, we, uh, actually, we're, sorry, we're learning those on the fly. Uh, so we're going to get clean speech, get the encoder, we get a latent representation. But instead of putting it through the decoder that gives us, that's going to give us that clean speech again, we're going to put it through the decoder of the noisy speech. Um, we're going to get some kind of a noisy reconstruction out of it. We're going to take that, put it back into the encoder of noisy speech, get a latent representation, put it back in the uh, uh, decoder of the clean speech, and then we're going to get something that should sound like clean speech. And what we want is, as we're going through this loop, we want to optimize all of those elements to give us exactly the same output as we started as an input. <clears throat> and then we're going to do the same thing again uh, the other way. We're going to take noisy speech, put it through some encoder, but decode it through the clean speech and uh, decoder. We're going to get some rendering of the uh, 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 noisy speech in a clean manner, put it back into the clean speech encoder, get the latent presentation, decode it through the uh, 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 noisy speech decoder, and then we should be able to get exactly the same signal we started with. And we're going to add, whoops, one more thing, which is that we want uh, for each of those cycles, we want to make sure that the latent representation we use is the same. So effectively, what's going to happen is that we're going to learn how to map speech into a space such that when we get a noisy version of it, uh, it still maps into the same space if we put it in through here. Um, I'm going to skip the math explanation of that. It's basically the same thing as we had in this slide. Uh, which <clears throat> so the end result is that we're going to get encoders and decoders um, that will use the same 
uh, a latent presentation for the same kind of input. So if I were to give it a clean recording of me saying, you know, hello, um, and I can put it through encoder, I will get a representation that will give me the ability to either use that in a clean decoder and get a clean version of that recording or put it in the noisy decoder and get a noisy version of it. Likewise, if I started with a noisy one, I'm going to end up, end up with the same representation here so I can render it as a clean sound or, 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 as, a, or as a noisy sound. So the advantage of that is that now we don't need to have matching pairs of inputs and outputs. It can work just as well uh, uh, using matched data. Uh, and we can do all sorts of other mappings, right? It doesn't have to be denoising. It could be the reverberation or, you know, room acoustics uh, transfer. Uh, so we can do a lot of cool stuff. So just to give you a couple of examples, <clears throat> here's an example of a sort of a, uh, uh, of an input. We stopped under the willows by Kempton Park and lunched. It is a pretty little spot there, a pleasant grass plateau running along by the water's edge and overhung by willows. We had just commenced. So I can hear that it's got a, a, a lot of background noise. This is what happens when we put it through this network and render it in the style of clean recordings. We stopped under the willows by Kempton Park and lunched. It is a pretty little spot there, a pleasant grass plateau running along by the water's edge and so, so I did a good job at removing the noise. And again, that's a speaker and type of noise that the system had not seen before. It's just trying to re-render that particular recording in the style of all the clean recordings that we had uh, given it. And we can do that with different things. So for example, here's a case where we changed the, uh, uh, the acoustics of, of a signal. So here's the input signal. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased, we had made a great deal of way. And here's the target style. Pretty little spot there, a pleasant grass plateau running along the water's edge. Now what's happening here is that the target style has a lot more reverberation, the, the speaker is more distant from the microphone than from the input. So now what we can do is render the input in the style of the transfer, and what we're gonna see is that we're gonna get the same reverberation and the same sort of noise characteristics that we had in the target uh, recording, even though it's the content spoken in the input recording. So let me play those again so you get the context, so input. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased, we had made a great deal of way. Target. Pretty little spot there, a pleasant grass plateau running along the water's edge. And style transfer. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased, we had made a great deal of way. So it's the same speaker. Although here. the breeze had now utterly ceased. But now he has the same type of muffling and reverberation that we had in the target style. Um, okay, so since we're running out of time, let me skip ahead a little bit. Uh, in fact, let me skip ahead a lot bit. And, okay, let me uh, go there. Whoops. So, <clears throat> So what I wanted to uh, sort of pass in the section is that we can use a lot of non-traditional training uh, uh, with those neural networks. There's a lot of interesting stuff that happens nowadays with, uh, with alternative architectures. Um, so we don't necessarily have to have ground truth data. And again, in a real life environment where you, know, you only get some noise recordings and maybe you have access to some clean recordings, uh, this thing can, can actually help you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna skip the, um, uh, the last part, which again, it was, uh, uh, probably not state of the art and not necessarily something you need to know. Um, just to give you a, a, a sense of what it was about, um, uh, what I talked about so far were discriminative, mo discriminative models where they're just trained to do regression from uh, noisy to clean. Um, you can actually use generative models as well, not necessarily GANs. Um, um, and if you use a, a sort of neural models like that, they will allow you to use, reuse one network for multiple tasks. The problem with the models that I've shown so far is that you train them to do one thing and then they kind of stuck. Perhaps maybe not the style transfer one, but the previous, def previous ones definitely. And you always would have to retrain them if you have new types of noise, new types of speakers, or you want to do a different task. Um, with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with generative models, that doesn't have to be the case. Their performance is a little lower than with discriminative models because they, they, they are not trained to do that one specific thing, uh, but they end up being, being a lot more powerful uh, 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 when it comes to deploying them to do different stuff. So uh, you sort of ran out of time, we don't, we don't have to talk about them, but I can send you links to, uh, to read up on them. Um, so uh, closing remarks. Um, so everything that we do is gonna, in this space, usually goes back to basic DSP. So uh, 
whenever you use any kind of neural network, try to figure out if I remove the nonlinearities and all the fancy stuff that we do with neural nets, what is the DSP operation that I'm doing? That's going to give you a lot of insight. It's going to help you connect those things to, to techniques that, uh, that are well known, and it's going to help you use those tricks and those techniques uh, uh, in the world of neural nets and understand what the limitations are. Um, so by, by, doing a lot, a lot, by using a lot of deep learning uh, uh, sort of layers as replacements to DSP uh, uh, elements, we effectively turbocharging existing algorithms. Um, it's very important to know what you're optimized. You have to know what your application is. Um, otherwise, you might be optimizing the wrong thing. Uh, so we talked about uh, uh, all of those things. Uh, and then efficiently is, is, uh, is something that's very, very important, right? Um, uh, th th there's a lot of things that happen in those, uh, in those models. We want to be careful that we want to be efficient with use of data, but we also want to be efficient with, uh, with computation. Um, especially if you care for deploying those things, uh, 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 that's a big deal. If you just write papers, then yeah, go nuts and have things that don't compute. Um, so, and finally, um, you have to keep up to date with those things. Um, every month there's a new paper coming out and it's, you know, 0.5 dB better than, uh, than last month. Um, so whatever I said now is probably going to be obsolete in, you know, six months. Uh, so these are only models that came out in the last couple of years or so. Um, so again, you have to keep uh, uh, abreast of all the uh, of all, of all developments. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is basically end this now. And thanks for... Uh, hanging out with me for three hours. Um, I'll be available on the Slack channel uh, today and tomorrow. Um, and then uh, I guess in a few hours, I'm going to send in the hands-on, which you guys are going to do tomorrow from what I hear. So if you have any questions, now's a good time. Otherwise, we can take it offline. Um, could I ask you a question on multi-channel reverberation? So um, you mentioned the reverberation a number of times. Then we spoke about how neural processing is kind of catching up with multi-channel DSP approaches. So um, has it been able to catch up with the likes of multi-channel linear prediction for the reverberation? Um, the answer is not entirely clear. So there are some networks that do the reverberation. Um, it's been pretty active. Um, I think until recently, we didn't have a good evaluation data set, so people were a little apprehensive. Um, I think the main problem in general is that, uh, and, and we saw that with, uh, with speech enhancement, that was the case, you know, seven years ago or so. Um, a, a lot of those neural network algorithms are, are very bare algorithms, right? We, we don't do anything special. Um, when you compare um, a sort of a, a bare algorithm like that with, uh, you know, modern DSP algorithms where people have spent decades fine tuning little bits and pieces, uh, and everything works well, um, it's obviously is not going to sound as good. Uh, you know, the artifacts that we get, for example, in the neural network algorithms that we have now um, are things that are solved problems with in DSP. It's just that, you know, it's not easy to, to implement those in a neural net. Um, so I don't think that the state of the art in reverberation right now with neural nets is as good as the state of the art in DSP. Uh, but it's a matter of time until people get better data sets, more powerful models, and, and find enough tricks to, to get there. Uh, so I have no doubt it's going to end up being better, uh, but I think we're still at the point where we're trying to figure out what's a good architecture, uh, you know, what kind of elements need to be there, or what kind of data do you need to train it on. Um, so, you know, if you, if you just want to deploy this right now into a product, I would say stick with what's, uh, you know, what people do in DSP. It's going to be more efficient. You, you're going to know what its limits are. Uh, but I'm sure in the next few years, especially since now, people are starting to think of denoising and source separation as an almost solved problem. Uh, people are going to shift attention into other enhancement problems. So uh, the, the, I think the reverberation is the next one to come, but, but I think it's still early steps. And people are still coming up with things which are not necessarily efficient because they're not causal. They will never work in real time. They have all these limitations that I've talked about. So we're still figuring it out, basically. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, hi, I have a quick question. Um, so, are these uh, are any of these models um, prone to adversarial examples? Um, there's a little bit of work on uh, adversarial examples. I think the main problem here is that there's not a clear adversarial goal into say denoising. I mean, you you can try to generate data that uh, you know speech that somehow defies denoising, but um, 
it, it's a weird operation to try to do. So I think the, uh, there's a lot more adversarial work being done with, um, with say speech recognition or speaker identification or stuff where you're trying to make a decision. Um, even though it's possible, I haven't seen anybody trying to figure out adversarial ways to, to confuse a denoiser. Um, I'm sure you can do it. Um, I just don't see quite why anybody would do that. Um, yeah, I was I was maybe talking of like uh, types of noise that are not really you know perceptible, but then you fit it into that noise and the signal is completely broken. Mm -hmm. Do you have examples? Yeah, so 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 that would get classified as a uh, sort of a out of training data kind of case, right? So <clears throat> suppose that I train my system on uh, on on speech, and then uh, um, um, and I'm just using you know regular ambient noises. Um, if, if I wanted to sabotage that, what I could do is give it a, a, a noisy speech signal and then add a very high frequency that's very loud, right? This would be something that would completely freak out the neural network because it's not something that it sees. And it would be something that would be otherwise inaudible by, by human listener. So you can do little things like that. Um, I wouldn't call them directly adversarial because they're not particularly sophisticated and it's very easy to trick a network that way. Um, uh, and, and certainly you can do that. Uh, but I haven't seen anybody actively trying to come up with uh, adversarial types of noise. Uh, but again, this is really going to uh, fall back to how good your denoising is. Uh, and it's also going to depend on the type of the network. For example, the style transfer network that I talked about wouldn't fall into that trap as easy just because they, they're trying to get something that sounds clean, not something that removes the noise necessarily. So again, depending on your architecture, um, you could have uh, 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 you know, a stronger effect or a weaker effect. Uh, but but it's relatively unexplored. I wouldn't say that people have done that a lot. Great, thanks. Uh, I have a question. Yep. So actually, I have several questions, but I will just ask one or two here. So okay. <clears throat> so for predicting the like, usually uh, in speech and asking the approach, we do uh, mass prediction using DNN. But will it make sense to predict the filter instead of the mask? using, say, like, unit mm -hmm. to predict um, the vector. I think this is open to debate. So there's a lot of different ways that uh, uh, people think about it. So the simplest way is to think in terms of binary masking. Um, of course, if you look closer, a lot of the networks that I've shown don't do binary masking. They do some kind of a soft masking. Um, I've heard people say that it's actually, at this point, a better idea to just try to reconstruct the output directly and not worry about doing, doing any masking. Um, so, honestly, I don't think there's going to be a clear answer. It's kind of a, a typical neural network thing where you just have to try everything and see what works. Um, it's also going to highly depend on your data. Um, you know, one thing that I've noticed is that uh, those networks, can, for example, can behave very differently when you have uh, simultaneous male speakers and when you have simultaneous female speakers just because there's a lot of... Uh, 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 you know, lower frequencies with male speakers, things get mixed more. It's a much more difficult problem than if you have only female speakers. So there's little things like that that will change how your front end looks like, what your the best reconstruction method is like. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't yeah. think there's one piece of advice I can give you, uh, but I would say there's, there's probably more ways to do reconstruction beyond masking, and you want, might want to take a look at them because they probably might make a difference in your problem. Okay. And um, my last question. Um, so, do you think the, if I use a non-autoregressive approach, such as wave flow for predicting mass, will it make sense? Yeah. Because so, they are very heavy, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I didn't talk about them, and we had a discussion with, uh, with Yanis about that as well. Um, there, there are a couple of papers where people use uh, uh, WaveNet-like architectures to do the same thing, right? You could train a WaveNet to receive noisy speech and then try to produce clean speech. Um, I think what's been uh, um, uh, sort of what, what people have been uh, what's been deterring people from doing more of that is the fact that the WaveNet is computationally a lot more expensive than all of these models. So from a practical standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense, um, but it does give you very good uh, uh, reconstruction quality. Um, I haven't seen any numbers which are competitive with the state of the art in sort of non-autoregressive models. Uh, but, but it might just be that it's a, it's a matter of time. I would like to note that 
Um, it's very easy to take uh, a lot of the recursive uh, 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 models that I've shown and kind of make them be kind of autoregressive by feeding back their own hidden states. So in some sense, some of them are autoregressive models. They're just not explicitly autoregressive like the wave net where you take the output and feed it back in. Um, uh, but yes, you can do that. People have done it. I just haven't seen it being compared in the same way uh, to see how much potential it has, but, but it does sound okay. It's not bad. Uh, no, no. My, my question was not to reconstruct the speech, but to predict the mask using the wave nets, oh. or say wave flow, not the speech itself. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in my mind, they're equivalent problems, right? It's, it's the same computational complexity to predict the speech or predict the mask. Um, that I haven't seen. Doesn't mean that somebody hasn't tried it, uh, but you could definitely use that, yes. Um, I think the problem with that is that you also need to have a space in which to apply the mask. Whereas uh, constructing speech directly would, would be uh, much more natural in, in that setting. 